How is everybody this morning? What's that? Did you? How many people went to the lobby? Wow. That's good. Um, still got people wandering in and just start telling the story. That'll bring him in. That'll bring him in. Hey, this is the most important thing you'll ever have to know. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. I noticed by you guys, you guys let me talk until like two o'clock or something without even a break. I'll do that, you know. I'll, t I'll tell you a quick little story once. I, uh, I showed up in this little town in eastern Utah one time, and there was probably 50, 60 people in this, in this group. And... Uh, Everybody wanted to start that at 6 p.m. on a Friday. <laughs> and I was supposed to talk for like three hours till nine and then they go home and, and we start the next day. Everybody was gonna meet for breakfast and we had somebody feeding all, everybody there at breakfast at 8 a.m. And then I was gonna start at nine and continue to six and do that for two more days, right? Well, what happened, it did not go as planned. Um, at nine o'clock, no one wanted to finish and asked me if I'd keep going. You should never do that. <laughs> because I told them I would talk as long as they would listen. <laughs> at 3 a.m., people were rolling sleeping bags who had a hotel two miles away in town. Okay, we're rolling sleeping bags out on the floor and I'm still talking. And they didn't want me to quit. They said, you promised. <laughs> they held me to it. They said, you promised you wouldn't stop talking as long as we would stay and listen. And no one had left, no one. All 80 people, or however many it was, stayed. It was probably, I don't remember, like, 60 to 80 people and they all stayed and they kept staying so at eight o'clock in the morning we took a break for breakfast and everybody had breakfast i talked all night and then at nine i started and i talked until 10 p.m we went to 10 p.m instead of six yeah and uh, then we quit, and everybody actually got to go use their hotel rooms. And we started the same way the next morning. Everybody met for breakfast at 8, started at 9, and I quit at 6 on time. But that was a lot, a lot of hours um, to fill because you guys wouldn't let me quit. So, <laughs> you don't, not anymore. <laughs> I've, I've gotten older. <laughs> I, I've, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, I've gotten older. I need my rest too. So especially I've been, uh, I've been running a marathon for months now in a row. And, uh, and I feel it. So, but I sure love my people. I love each and every one of you. <laughs> I love this country very, very much. I think we live in one of the most beautiful places on earth. And uh, and 
and I feel everybody's pain. I'm one of those guys that just soaks up the pain from everyone. And I feel it all, every, every phone call I get when you guys call me and, and things are happening in your lives that most people have a hard time even getting through. And, uh, and I just feel every bit of it. And I wish I could help more. Sometimes just advice, just having somebody to talk to makes a difference. I think we can solve a lot of problems on a bigger scale so that these individual problems aren't, aren't, uh, are hurting so many of, uh, of us, our American people. And uh, I think <clears throat> I think we can uh, we can get these problems solved in a way that's uh, that will avert war. My concern, though, is that they don't want to avert war. They're trying to get us to stand up and go to war. And they're trying to do it in a very, very big way. And they really are. They're creating so many problems for all of us are, you know, I'm scared to death of water anymore. You know, last year um, we were catching these trucks that spray chemicals onto the roadways to de-ice. And we got videos up in Missouri of multiple videos of these de-icing trucks pulling off at bridges and emptying the trucks into the river. Yeah, lots of them. And I've heard that happening all across the country in the colder states where they have to worry about that. Well, the problem with that is those colder states are our northern higher elevation states and the rivers drain to the south to the states that don't even use those chemicals. And you know, I always turn back to the Bible and it says that in the end times, uh, one third of all the sea life will die off. One third. Well, what's gonna cause that? Them poisoning the water. And uh, please don't ever drink Dasani for one. You know, they're, they're pushing that hard and heavy everywhere. Dasani came out of nowhere and became one of the biggest companies, water companies, for a reason. These massively big hundred plus billion dollar foundations that are out there that are killing us all, and they are killing us all. Um, those big companies, those foundations that are behind those big companies, uh, they, don't, they don't care about you and me and our kids. By God, they won't let their own kids drink their water, but they want to force it on everyone else, especially you can't even go to an airport and find bottled water that's not Dasani, pretty much, everywhere you look. I've been in a lot of airports, and uh, you sure don't want that water. I know a guy who's a truck driver who delivers to Sonny, and they issue him a scanner. And when he goes to the warehouse to get the trucks loaded, they scan every pallet to make sure that it sat and cured in the warehouse a long enough period of time. Because if it's too fresh, it will kill you. The, 
Yeah. What's that? Right, it doesn't freeze. I learned that on construction sites. When I had my construction companies, the employees would leave bottles of water all over the job site, you know, half, half drink bottles of water. And they were just good at that. And I always got there early in the morning. And it would be 10 degrees outside in the wintertime. And uh, I'd go around the job sites and take all these half empty bottles of water, throw them into a wheelbarrow and take them out to the trash. And I used to dump them out and Dasani just is gel. It doesn't freeze. The good bottled waters, they'll freeze solid and you just throw them away. But Dasani, you could, it does not freeze. So I've probably done that as low as 10 degrees and have it still be gel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all these things you gotta you gotta bear in mind. Know where your meat comes from, because right now they're poisoning meat bad. And even our European guys, I I know the meat processing plants over there. Uh, we've watched them. And they are uh, they are building meat products that look real that aren't, and they're poison. You ever seen three D printed meat? They can print up a steak that looks real, tastes real, cuts like it's real, and it was done on a three D printer, bone and all, bone and all. Yeah. I want you guys, our health is some of the most important thing we have. Okay. So take advantage of the new technologies in health that are coming out and stay away from the doctors. Stay away from the pharmaceuticals. Don't take prescription drugs unless there's no other emergency alternative and it's an emergency. Okay. But even that, there's natural things you can do to replace antibiotics and things like that. So learn, learn what natural things are out there. We've got to stay healthy. Our American people have to stay healthy. And we are the country that they're really targeting the most with these poisons. Okay. And our own farmers from our heartland of America. I'll tell you what, years ago, Colorado State University, Oregon State University, the University of, of Wisconsin and Madison, these universities used to call me in to come speak. I'm actually an expert on agriculture. And I've got patents on hydroponic equipment. And I used to build and teach dairies how to feed wholesome feed without any RBSTs, any antibiotics, anything. And their cows live longer. And I'm really good at it. And these universities used to call me and, and have me come, come talk and work with the farmers. In fact, I'll tell you a personal story. I don't even like telling a story, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. Kamala Harris. I'm going to tell you a personal story between me and Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris used to be the attorney for the Central Valley Farmers Association of California before she became the head attorney in the state of California, before she became vice president. And this was back, I'm going to guess, probably around 2011 or 12. And she calls me up, she wants me to come speak because uh, I had been selling these hydroponic machines to farmers in the Central Valley of California and the word spread and they wrote it up in the Central Valley uh, Farmers Association newspaper that went to all the Californians. And if you don't know, the Central Valley of California is very large and it grows one third of all of our food products 
in the United States. See, the farmers up here grow corn and soybeans and things that'll kill you. Soybeans and corn will kill you. I want you to understand that. Stop eating it. The wheat they grow up here will kill you. Stop eating it. If you can stay away from the wheat, corn, and soy that's grown in this side of the Rocky Mountains, you will be healthier. And the more you stop buying it, buying, and I'm talking about for your animals and everything else, well, then they won't be grown as much. It's supply and demand. Business is always supply and demand. And Pioneer and Monsanto and Bayer got together to stop me from speaking years ago at the universities. And what they did is they went around to all these professors that were trying to teach the farmers a better way to farm and a healthier way to farm and feed us. They got together and they bribed the professors with large sums of money. One of the professors of the university there, Madison, it was University of Wisconsin-Madison, him and I were working great together, just absolutely great. And then all of a sudden, he wasn't calling me and I couldn't get a hold of him. So I got on an airplane. I flew from Bend, Oregon to, to Madison, Wisconsin, walked in the university, walked in the waiting room to his office and uh, told the secretary that I needed a meeting with him and I'll wait. Now, they don't know how persistent I am because I'll sit there all damn day and wait. And I'm sitting there and I'm waiting and there was some newspapers, local newspapers and stuff on, on this coffee table for people to read. And I turned one of them over to the front page and it was an article about this particular man that I was there to see who had just got a $20 million grant from Monsanto. And I walked into his office with that newspaper and I threw it down on his desk and I said, so this is why? And he goes, what do you mean why? And I said, why you stopped calling me and why you stopped answering my phone calls? I said, you sold out, didn't you? Because from that moment on, he wasn't recommending to the farmers of the Wisconsin and Minnesota area to talk to me. And no one was calling me. Well, Kamala, down there in California, she uh, bought me some plane tickets, a very nice suite in a hotel and a rental car. And I flew into San Francisco. And... Uh, jumped in the rental car and I was supposed to have a meeting with the Central Valley Farmers Association in Gilroy, California, which is the heart of, of the farming in the Central Valley. And I'm driving down past Redwood City on the freeway on my way there, about an hour away from where I was supposed to go. And uh, she calls me and she says, she says, uh, We've had more people show up this morning to listen to you than I've ever seen at any of our meetings, and we're going to have to change venues. So anyway, they, uh, they moved the venue, and she sent me the coordinates, uh, you know, the a map pin on your phone. And I show up, and I showed up at the school school that I went to kindergarten in. Yeah. Literally the school I went to kindergarten in. And uh, we met in the gymnasium and there was, there was about 500 farmers there. After it was done that day, it was just a one day deal. And after, after I was finished, I went to the hotel and this is a very nice hotel in San Jose, California. And as I went to the hotel, 
there's a big restaurant bar. It's kind of open, an open wall, big restaurant bar off to one side. And I realized I, I talked that whole day and I didn't eat. Every, the farmers all had catered food across the back, you know, and they were all snacking, but I was up talking, not feeding my face. So I was hungry. So I went in to get something to eat and I walked in and Kamala Harris had been sitting over there and she walks over and she sits down beside me with her booze and started talking to me. And uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. But uh, I've learned some things about who he is. I, I mean, she is. <laughs> So, that was an interesting thing. All right, I hope that got us started. All right. <clears throat> because they're not doing it. See, this is, this is, thank you for saying, bringing this up. She said, because you guys didn't hear and the people on the video didn't hear, I'm going to say it again. She says, if this is all a movie and these, and these people are all fake, why are they poisoning our water and our food if it's the White House? Okay, let's clarify this right now. Who is they? It isn't them doing anything. Biden's not doing a damn thing. Okay, he can barely get up before 11 o'clock in the morning. He's done by one. He, he's not doing anything. Kamala's not doing anything. Have we even heard from Kamala in a long time? Have any one of you seen her face on TV recently? Yeah, I don't think she's around. Okay, and they don't need her as an actor because she wasn't good anyway, so they don't need to hire an actor to play her part because it isn't her anyway. I can tell you it's not her because I've had her sitting right next to me drinking booze. And who, whoever ran for vice president was not Kamala Harris. Yeah, it, it was switched out before the election. So I'm telling you, these people aren't real. They're not who you think they are. I think we can all know that pretty well. One thing about cameras, we can't hide anywhere. Do you know how many cameras are around this building? They're all around the, the building. You can't hide anywhere. There's one on every street lamp almost. Those big lamps they put on the freeways around Dallas, Fort Worth, that have the circle of lights. You have no idea what those circle of lights do. They track all of you. Every single person they track everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you get a green light, your, your camera's working. If you get a, a yellow light on there, the microphone's on. Okay. They're tracking you everywhere you go. One of the biggest ways they track you is in your own home with your television set. If you've got a flat screen TV, please don't sit in front of it naked eating Cheetos. <laughs> okay? Because they're going to see you, and it's not pretty. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> I try and keep these light and funny sometimes, but sometimes I even embarrass myself. Um, <laughs> so, who is they? Let me tell you something it is not our politicians that are doing this, they're all puppets. Our Congress is puppets, our Senate's are puppets. Uh, they're not, they're, they're not. They're here to pretend 
to help. <laughs> oh, that hurt to say. Um, it is big, massive, evil corporations. That's who they are. They're owned by the same people who commit the usury on us. This is, this goes right to back to Jesus. Only violent event in his life, a time where he got violent. Can you imagine the most perfect man on the planet getting violent? Who loved everybody, who healed everybody, who loved his people more than anything. And he screamed and yelled at the Pharisees all the time. Okay. He screamed and yelled at the, the Khazarian Jews that were running things and harming the people. Okay. They weren't even forgiven the people according to Jewish law every seven years and every 70 years, right? They weren't doing that. So Jesus literally walked into the temple and saw what they were doing. He turned around and walked out and he went home and he made whips. He fashioned whips. And he came back and he turned their tables over and whipped and beat them out the door. He chased them out the door and he whipped them with leather whips and straps. And Jesus was a big guy. He was tall. He was strong. He had been a carpenter, right? You carry a lot of heavy wood and a lot of heavy tools and work with your hands and run around the world as much as he did. See, there's years missing out of the Bible of Jesus' life, even though his life was short. There's years that were missing that aren't being talked about in the Bible. Where did he go during those times? I can tell you he went all the way through Asia to Vietnam to the Philippines. What does the word Filipino mean? First people. Yes, everyone is frozen. It looks like they are coming back. Shares are gone down, but a few years ago, the WHO, 80% of the stakeholders of the WHO was the Gates Foundation. 80% of the money that started it was from the Gates Foundation. He doesn't own 80% of the WHO anymore. There's other big corporations, other big foundations. You don't understand Soros probably at all. Insurances are one of the most profitable of all industries on, on, on a percentage of profit basis. They're one of the most profitable. And Soros owns the vast majority of all the insurance companies in, in the world. The amount of money flowing through those corporations, they don't even have to touch his hands. They don't have to even go into his foundation. Each one of those companies have foundations. All these partner companies I read to you, that was just on one part of the puzzle of the hierarchy of this one world government, one piece. And I read off a whole bunch of companies that are the stakeholders because those companies set up foundations to invest in the stuff that kills you or that keeps track of you or that controls all of uh, the cattle. So are they there to keep us healthy? I don't see it. <laughs> okay. The WHO, the CDC, these guys, WEF. You know, one thing, I don't know, how many, how many people watched the, some of the Davos conferences this year? Did you see some beautiful things happen in those conferences? with some incredible people standing up and the old cabal standing up and having to leave the room. 
we the people are standing up. I want to tell you something. I might drag him up here later, but the man that I had up here yesterday from Belgium, Hans, I remember back when I met him a few months ago, he was telling me how he got 7,000 people to show up in Belgium at the Capitol building. Last night at dinner, he was showing me pictures where he has gotten more than 500,000 people to show up. Love you, brother. 500,000 strong showing up. I, I just want you to, to get a picture in your head right now. 500,000, half a million people. What the size of that crowd looks like. It was unbelievable. He, well, the video was literally split, sped up. And the street was full from building to building, across the sidewalks and the streets, and it was sped up, and people were just coming through there. 500,000 people. A lot of these counties that are really corrupt in the, in the United States, and I'm going to pick on the county I was in in Texas, Johnson County. That city... That's the county seat is only 35,000 people. What would it look like if we dropped 500,000 people into Claiborne, Texas and told the judges and the sheriff's department and everybody else to knock it off or we'll hang them? Now we got to give them the opportunity to repent. We got to give them the opportunity to repent. Gorsuch just did that. He really did. He told them we don't have to. But we've got to show them the letter because they're not looking at it. They're not reading it. They probably don't even know it exists. These people are getting up every day just doing their job the same way they've done it the last 40, 50, 60 years and doesn't give a crap about the people and don't even know that they're being evil. Well, maybe they do, but whether they do or not isn't even the point. The point is they are. They are evil, and they need to have the opportunity to see it and believe it and repent. And if they don't repent, I don't care what happens to them. They prove themselves evil. I'm all for just, you know, taking the high road. Let them, get, what? <laughs> Let them go meet God. <laughs> and I'm all for that. But we've got to give them that opportunity to repent, which means we've got to stand up peacefully and we've got to put them on notice. And they've got to realize that because there's enough of us telling them that they ought to be darn scared of continuing in the way that they're continuing. Now, I'm seeing a lot of them that are changing, that are good, and they are changing. And if they're going to re repent and change and show by their actions that they're changing, you know, I'll stand right beside them, brother and sister. But they've got to do it. But it's up to us to make sure they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we the people are pissed off and we've had enough. And in America, we're not standing like they are in Europe. We're not. You know what it looks like when a million and a half people, almost two million people, descend on Paris, France? Go look at that and say, when was the last time we did that here? <laughs> when? That wasn't even enough. And they were set up.
They knew we were coming. See? And they thought they could stop us with that one event. And you know what? They did a lot. They scared so many people with that one event that a lot of you guys, and I don't mean you in the room, but in general, my American people, a lot of my American people stopped. They quit. They went and did something else that was easier. They bought fishing boats. We can't do that. We've got to stand up. How we stand up is a number of different ways. Just one way how we got started was with our AORs. People don't realize how important that damn piece of paper was and what it did for this country. That got us started on this trip that we're on, this journey to rising up, to stopping the corruption. It was the most important thing we could have ever done to get started, uh, bar none. There's nothing else we've done in the United States since those AR, AORs started that has been as important. Nothing. You bombard a State Department with 40 million pages times 30 or 35, even if you guys shrunk yours down to 10 pages, it still adds up. And it's a tremendous amount of papers. Do you know they were putting shipping containers at the post office in Washington, D.C. to store our crap in? And had to hire extra guards, hire, have to hire extra people to open the envelopes? Yeah, I got one report from a little gal there at the State Department. She's going, I was hired just for this job. She says, after two weeks, I went, holy crap, what are they doing? <laughs> she did. She called me up on the phone because the AORs convinced her to be a state national. Yeah. He goes, guys don't realize the wide ranging effect of, of this. Just, just hundreds and hundreds of people all over the United States doing this has started this on a path that it can't be stopped now. Yeah. But it ain't over. We got to continue. And now we got to hit other groups of people, not just the State Department. That's one that was a very powerful agency that felt the effect. A very powerful agency. The most powerful is our judiciary and our bar associations going to feel the effect. They have been already. Judges are getting, they don't know what to do with you guys anymore. Just traffic tickets alone and all the traffic videos and the, the, the <laughs> now not everybody does that perfect, I can tell you that. <laughs> but damn it, you tried. I don't care if it's perfect. I don't care if you screw up. I really don't want you injured. So try and be a little smarter <laughs> in how you do it. But when you do it, it's making a huge difference. They're recognizing it now. They're seeing it out there. Keep doing it and do it more. You'll live through it, I promise you. You're in good company. You're amongst apostles and prophets. Okay? You're putting yourself out there just like Christ did. These things are so important, so important. We got to stop the freaking fear mongering. It's the one thing that, you know, I, I, I do love Bobby Lawrence. 
But the one thing about him that pisses me off to no end is he's scared. And that's a big, powerful man. And I see the fear. And the fear harms him. He gets over the fear he could be great. He is great. Not everybody likes him. He's hard on people. He's harsh at the mouth, what I call it. He's, he's not soft. He's not politically correct by any means. He's going to piss people off. That's okay. Not everybody likes everybody else. We all have different personalities. We're all human beings. We're all different spirits. And some of us get along great with others, and some of us don't. That's okay. We're not perfect. Just realize we're not perfect. Learn what you can learn from people and keep doing it. I don't care who you learn from. I'm not up here telling you to listen to me and nobody else. Never have. Learn what you can learn. Do it with the right heart and the right meaning behind you. Look into my eyes, see if I got the right heart. But don't tell me I don't. I strive every day for humility. Every day I pray, how can I help someone else? Start doing that. Start improving your spirit inside. Okay? Be men, be tough men, be strong men. And by God, men, I've seen the women in this country be stronger than us. Stop it. Grow up here. <laughs> Go out and talk to people and don't be afraid to talk to them. Okay? I love you all. But you're going to have to be stronger. You're going to have to be the patriarchs of your families. You're going to have to be leaders and lead. Do it without ego as much as possible. Okay? It's, it, it's, it's not about ego for me. I don't care. People can say whatever they want, and I just keep moving forward. It just goes bounces off don't worry about that don't worry about what others are saying don't worry about anything you worry about how can I help my fellow man today what can I do to stop the corruption today what am I going to do today to get off my ass and be motivated enough to go talk to some people okay and ladies, do the same. Protect your family. Protect your children. Hang on to them with everything you've got. And don't let anybody take that child out of your arms. And understand something. You have the right to defend yourself to the death, if need be. And they will kill some of you. But you have that right. That God-given right, are you tough enough? Because I watch too many people on videos cry and go buckle their kids into the car seat of the CPS worker's car. Crying and yelling and screaming and cussing at them. And why are you taking my kids? Well, what they don't know is the trick they just played. They told you to go buckle her into the car, and you did it. That's consent. Me, I would have said, hold on a minute. I would have went back in the house and came out armed. You understand. They don't have any right to do that. They don't have any authority to do that. The law doesn't give them any authority to do that. Only corporate policy does. And corporate policy is not law. Is it, Sadie? 
it's it's nice kind of having an attorney in the room. <laughs> you know I'm doing it for a reason. I know you've seen the light now and come out of the darkness. She's been light for a long, long, long time, guys. So I'm 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 pulling her leg a little bit because I love her so much, but that's the background she came from. And I'll tell you what, Zadie, I wish there was a hundred people in the room with the same background and they were on our side helping us. Because if we had a hundred of you in the room, that shit we could accomplish would be unbelievable. See, she fights and she fights for other people and she does it with the law and she does it with well-written documents. She writes way better than I do. And she does it with well-written, she corrects stuff all the time for me. She says, David, that's wrong. <laughs> it's okay, I'm a farm boy from a mill town in Oregon. I'm just trying my best. But she has that background. We need people from different backgrounds. And it's very, very important. Everybody is special in this room. Everybody has special talents. I want you to use your talents. If you are an accountant and you have great money talents or a tax preparer, let me teach you the truth about taxes and about the IRS and then take that knowledge you've gained and go freaking destroy them with it because it's not hard. It's not hard to destroy the IRS and our money system and our banking system in this country because they've been so fraudulently illegal for so long and they admit it. Now, once they admit it and we have their admission document, <laughs> well, how are they gonna argue? They wrote it. We didn't make that shit up. The law is all on our side. The law is 100% on our side. Now, that doesn't mean the police are. That doesn't mean the county attorney or the DA is. That doesn't even mean half the judges are. Some of those judges are out there now that I'm seeing. I'm seeing some court cases finally that they're doing the right thing. And then some of them are just pure freaking evil. And they'll look you in the eye and you've proven the law to them and they'll look you in the eye and they'll say, I don't care. I don't care about what the law is. I don't care about our policy. I don't care about our local rules. I'm going to do what it is that I want to do. Well, the minute they say that to you, and by God, I've had judges say that in a courtroom, in a court of law. And when they say that, they just prove themselves to be evil. So what do we do with them? We ask them what color the drapes are. Because we might have to change them when we own their freaking house. And the toys their kids play with. See, they lose their judicial immunity when they step outside the bounds of their office and they violate our rights. It's gone. There is no immunity for them, is there, Zadie? They try and claim that. This is my court. I'm a man, blah, blah. They got all these little immunity clauses, but the Supreme Court's already ruled on that and overruled all that. See? They lose that. And these police officers, what they don't know is the vast amount of liability they carry upon their shoulders without knowing it. And the funny thing is they can operate in that job for an entire career. It only takes one person to destroy a police officer for not doing his job properly. One person, one legal event, and his job's gone, and his house is gone, and his cars are gone. And it's a hard lesson for him to learn, and I don't want him to learn it. I don't want his kids to be without a house. I don't want his kids to be without electricity. I don't want his kids to be without a dad earning some money. So what I'd like the police to do is understand that the county attorney and his superiors or 
Tickle in Texas is not training the police properly. And they've opened themselves up to tremendous liability that they don't even know because they're not being told that they're going to be held liable. I'm going to tell you a quick little story about a sheriff up in Montana. Just south of where Zadie lives right now. A few years back, this particular sheriff, I ran into a man that I knew who had a friend living with him because he had lost just about everything, had been dragged to court because he was walking down the street and the sheriff violated his constitutional rights. And he knew others in town, five others in town, that the sheriff had done the same kind of stuff to. So we got all those small group of people together. And I found out that the sheriff's department had an insurance policy with a constitutional writer Though if they violate the people's constitutional rights, then the insurance policy would pay off. And their insurance company was called MACO, the Montana Association of County something or other. I don't really care. <laughs> and MACO, we got a hold of MACO and we filed a claim. And we filed a, a lawsuit in the county court Told, telling Mako we will drop the lawsuit, drop the claim if they want to settle. But otherwise, we're taking the sheriff to court. And Mako settled for the amount of the rider, which was $5 million. Now, they offered to settle for 150000 divided by six people, not a lot of money. They settled for $4,995,999. I told them one, I sued them for $1 less than what their policy covered. And they finally settled with that. And each one of those six people split $5 million, got a pretty big chunk of money. Well, what happened to the sheriff over that? Oh no, Mako came in and took care of the sheriff. He had to put up his house as a bond, and if he should ever be sued again, Mako will own the house. They could have taken his house. What's that? And not issued another policy. That's right. Montana requires by law that all the sheriffs have this policy, right? That's right. You're out of business. And he could have, they could shut down the sheriff's department. All of them would be without a job. It's not a bad thing. We don't need them. Hmm? It's just a writer on an insurance policy that uh, guarantees that they're not going to harm anybody via their, any rights that are broken, which they break every day. Seriously, they're out there breaking your rights every day. And we have rights in this country. People don't know it. They try and tell you that you don't have them. But you do, because every contract you've been under since you were born is an unconscionable contract. Let me ask you a question. How old were you when you got your driver's license? You were underage. You can't even sign a legal and binding contract at 16 years old. You've got to be at least 18 and an adult to sign a contract like that. 
going. That's right. You get, you, they did it on purpose. They did it on purpose. You used to be, years ago, travel in this country with a passport and nothing but a passport. And you could have and, draw, and be in an automobile at 12 years old if you wanted, but your parents would not have let you back then because the parents were, were better, in my opinion. Except when they're not home. <laughs> See, see, I bought my first car, a Willys Jeep pickup, from my grandfather when I was 12. $650, and I drove the tires off of it at 12 years old on every back logging road you can imagine. Miles and miles and miles flying through the mountains, find fishing spots, places to pan for gold, and Oregon's a great place. But anyway... I did at 12 years old, but I'm not saying do that. Okay. In fact, don't let your kids out on these roads at 12. 18 is too young, uh, but you used to be able to use a passport with your parent in the car if you were under 18. And what government did is they came in and said, oh, well, we'll let you have a driver's license at 16. And you can drive without your parents in the car. You can get a permit at 15 with your parent in the car for a year of training. And then from 16 to 18, you can drive without your parents. And they sold all of those kids that in high school, driver's ed classes and, you know, the whole works. And they sold us into it. We went down at 16 and we got our driver's license. And we couldn't even legally sign a contract at that age. And we did. So what kind of contract is that? Thank you. I was hoping you would say null and void. It's a null and void contract. Right off the bat. Everything we've done our whole life has been an unconscionable contract, right? From our mama being an informant on our birth certificates. What is the definition of an informant? You got that police officer in the room? An informant is someone who gives someone else up to another, thereby giving title and equity to the state. She voluntarily walked into a foundling hospital. Definition of foundling is a safe place to abandon a mother. Uh, the reason I tell you these things, even though you know them already, is to keep it right here in your face. You need to be out there telling everyone else. Uh-huh. Foundling Hospital, birthing ward, a doc tender, a doctor. Baby coming out of the water, being docked at the dock by the dock tender, where a bill of lading is received. The whole thing is a shipping nightmare. And it's all how we got in our admiralty. It's how we got trapped into these unconscionable contracts. Is the birth certificate a bad thing? Okay, I'm going to give you my opinion. And I never ever do this. I really don't give you my opinion. I actually give you a fact out of law because I've read a lot. But my opinion is this. No, it's not a bad thing. Because it contains a trust. We were all born and we were insured. Now, the bad part about it is this. What made it a bad thing is they did it without full and honest disclosure of the terms and conditions of the contract, which is required by law to be a contract. <laughs> and because we didn't get the terms and conditions of the contract, and we didn't get full and honest disclosure, it, it is a bad thing in a way. But once we wake up to the fact that we didn't get it, but it still exists, and we go, whew, man, they did a very nice thing for me. They created a $100 million retirement account, a <laughs> $100 million estate in my name. Do you know why all that was really done and how the cabal took advantage of it? Remember... A mirror reflects good and evil. Everything righteous stands in front of a mirror, and the evil 
does the opposite. So these SESTA QV Trust Acts, going clear back to the 1600s and even a little before, there were some way before, it evolved over time. But all these contracts started with a good purpose. And you know what that purpose was? You are the descendants of King Solomon. And King Solomon was blessed by God with all the minerals of the world to hold in trust for the benefit of the people in the last days during the thousand years of peace. We're not quite there yet. But we're getting very close. And... That's what it was for. That was a righteous trust purpose. And all kinds of things in the evil world of banking and the cabal have taken place, even with the Committee of 300 and the Illuminati and all that, they can't touch. Because they're evil, they can't touch the trust. And some of the oldest trusts in the world, the Bedford Trust, contains a vast majority of that gold and silver of the world that's heirs of King Solomon. The family's gold and silver, which the families held in trust for all of us, for the benefit of the people in the world that's during the thousand years of peace. And it's the people's money. We're, we're the beneficiaries. The billions of people on earth are all the beneficiaries. And there's so much there that everybody's a hundred millionaire. There will be no classes of people. There will be no rich because there will be no poor. None. And you don't even have to, won't even have to physically have it in your possession. You'll just be able to go use it whenever you need, for whatever you need, to give away to whomever you please, to, to be creative. Can you imagine a great painter, a great artist who never has to worry about selling his paintings and making a living to eat? the beautiful works he could produce if he just sat in his studio all day and was creative and the poetry you could write and the beautiful things we could do with our lives that you want to do if you never had to worry about where your next meal comes from your utility bills being paid where your next house payment car payment your car breaking down you don't have to worry about any of that crap Car breaks down, take it back to the dealership, get a new car, they'll fix it, and somebody else will want it. See, nothing, you'll never have to worry about anything. And that's all possible. You know how I know it's possible? I've seen the accounts. I've seen how many zeros are in the accounts. Man, if you got an account with 478 followed by 152 zeros, that would solve a, a lot of problems for a lot of people, won't it? Okay. Well, that's the Pentagon's account. Held in trust, and the Pentagon can't even get at it because it hasn't been given to them yet. You know, they, don't, they won't need it for that. They won't even need it for that. There's accounts like that in every bank in the world. And the CEO of that bank can't touch that account. It won't come out of the computer without the right signatures and the right clearance. But we've been keeping alive the guy that has that. And right now, if I could get Trump to Bedminster bed 
to his own place up there for a meeting with this one guy. We could solve all the problems tomorrow. It would take him three days to get it done. It would be over with. And we've contacted Trump's attorneys. We've contacted him, and he just won't sit down with somebody. So I'm pissed at him. His attorney has actually set up an appointment to meet the guy I'm talking about. Set up an appointment. You understand he lives three miles from Trump's place up there in the Northeast, three miles away. Be nothing to get them together. So one of Trump's attorneys lives up there too. So we get an appointment with Trump's attorney to go meet. You know what happens? Attorney stood him up. Now this guy's way more powerful than President Trump is. You know why he's more powerful? Because he's got the codes. He's got the clearance. He's got the signatures of the 13 royal families to solve the problem, and he is the head of the Bedminster Trust. That stuff's above country, you guys. It's above countries. It's above the UN. It's God's money. It's way above countries. It's way above man. But it's for the benefit of mankind. And we got political leaders in this world that won't freaking listen. I've known him for years. None of the importance. Been working on this project for more than 30 years. This is one of the things I do. People don't understand how important this stuff is, and we can't get the right people together. Well, maybe that's God keeping them apart. Maybe the timing's not right. I don't know God's time, and that is so hard for me. I wish you'd just tell me. What day? I'll arrange the meeting. <laughs> But he doesn't. So we keep trying, we keep pursuing until he says, all right, today's the day. And God does that crap to me all the time, and I, there's nothing I can do about it. People on our channel go, go, David, the asteroid didn't hit. I said, you know, I knew that. I didn't think it was going to in November. I really didn't. Because November is not November. God's whole calendar is different than that. See this. There are so many people that know about this and they still get it wrong. Maybe that's God keeping them from the truth too. But this is a 13 month lunar calendar that in 1931, Congress was petitioned to change our calendar from the Gregorian calendar to this 13 month lunar calendar, which still is wrong, but it's a whole lot more right than the, than the calendar we're under, which is incredibly wrong. You know there's different steps of being wrong? You can be really, really wrong. <laughs> and you can be 20% wrong and 30% wrong or 100% wrong. It's still wrong. But it's a lot closer. If we were under just this calendar, we would be closer to God. Our vibratory level would increase just being on the right calendar without all those pagan holidays. Our bodies would feel a whole lot better under this calendar and would heal themselves better and we would live longer if we change this calendar. And that's scientific 
we proved. Everything evil has done to us by changing things. They started 45 years before Christ and changed it from a calendar similar to this. They changed it to the Julian calendar 45 years before Christ. It's more than 2,000 years ago. And they changed the calendar. And then under Gregory, they changed it again, right? When you know this stuff, do you know you could actually operate the, with this if you wanted to? You could operate with this in the legal documents if you wanted to. Did you know that? Didn't, didn't Congress make the Bible, the Word of God, law under Public Law 97-280? Right? You know, you can file your Bible in your court case. Go buy a cheap Bible, $10 Bible, and go file it in your court case. You know, the court clerks have to accept that and put that on the docket and on the record as law. Start doing it. First, it'll help increase Bible sales. That can't be a bad thing. But if we moved closer to something like this, we would get closer to God. Remember, Sept is seven, Oct is eight, Nova is nine, Dec is 10, Jan is 11, Feb is 12, Mar is 13. December is not the 12th month, it's the 10th month. April is month one. There's a month between June and July, an entire month, Sol, S-O-L. There's a 13th zodiac sign. Most of the, the letters are silent, but it's really about Cephas, which is a dragon zodiac. Do you know there were kings in the past that had pet dragons? These things really existed. And then now they found actual skeletons of them now, recently, of all sizes, from little tiny dragons to great big dragons. And they found them archaeologically now and proven it. Yeah. You guys think I'm going off on a tangent here, or do you think it's important? It's incredibly important. It really is. It's incredibly important. How many people went onto the website and downloaded this document yesterday? That ain't enough, but it's a good start. Did you have any problems doing it? Okay. No, but it is on Freemanbot. Okay. No, I, I want you to know this is a culmination of everything that we pulled out of various policy manuals and employee manuals of the agencies that we need to learn from. The Social Security Administration, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, things that we need to learn from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC. We, we, do you understand? We read it all in the last few months. All of it. It's probably why I can barely see up here to read. Oh, I got a pair. Somebody bought me a pair. <laughs> it's still got the 2.0 tag. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, three people now have offered me glasses. 
from yesterday. So thank you. <laughs> That's funny, but um, we went back and we read a bunch of canon law. And I went back and I read a bunch of Corpus Juris Secundum. And uh, I know that's a weird thing for most people, but there's some things we found that are incredibly important. So Corpus Juris Secundum, Section 16, page 892, is called Fact of Death. Fact of Death. Death of the person on whose estate administration is sought is a jurisdiction requisite. A jurisdiction requisite. Death of a person on whose estate administration is sought. Okay, you walk into a courtroom, what are you? You're dead. You're dead. They give you a summons, what did they do? They summon the dead into court. It's a seance. They're wearing black robes. The lights are a little bit dim. It's all wood, dark wood, usually. They're summoning the dead into court, and, and you're just generally appearing. That's why they call it an appearance. You got to understand the words, okay, that they use. And while the presumption of death arises from absence may present a prima facie case sufficient to warrant a grant of administration, yet if it subsequently develops that such person was in fact alive, alive, the administration is void. The hardest thing to do is prove we're alive. It's the hardest thing. You want to avoid all their court crap? Prove you're alive. What if I told you we just found a way to put in all the computer systems of the United States government and the rest of the world that you're alive and no longer dead? I'm telling you what, these core quirks will pull up on the computer system and see that, hey, this man's alive, he's no longer dead, and they won't even create a docket. They won't create a bond. It'll be on the police officer's computer, leave him the hell alone. Don't stop him. Do not stop, do not detain, leave him alone. You got, we got to leave the living alone. You understand all of government has to leave the living alone? Because you have the right to what? Life. Exactly right. This is hard to get through people's heads, believe it or not. Go talk to your attorney and your state prosecutor about this. You know what they do? They run from the room. And the ship. <laughs> None of them will stick around for a conversation. You know how I know? <laughs> I've done it multiple times. And they just run. This is where you truly get them when you got something like this in your hand. Say, hey, you know that? Well, here's my suggestion. See if you can get their email addresses. And every day, just send them a page or two and say, hey, Bob, did you know this? I think this might be of interest to you. You don't even have to go see them. You do this every day for three or four months, or at least until he blocks your email. And you do it to all of them. 
how hard is it to get the names of every attorney in your town? Now, let's just say you got 20 people in a town who are sending all the attorneys in your town an email every day for three months. I'm trying to find you guys shit to do. <laughs> Get off the couch. This way you can sit on the couch with your laptop, with your Cheetos. <laughs> Don't do it naked. And just hit the, your email list. Daily. You know, don't you guys get j junk email that comes in every day from some company and something and you haven't unsubscribed to them, right? Well, will you guys please go be their junk email? Please. Start with Gorsuch's letter. Right? Just start with that. A page like this that I just gave you uh, on, on that. Corporate, see how easy this is? Just like two paragraphs, a little title. Dear lawyer, please take notice. Okay. While it is true that the presumption of death arises from a person's absence unheard from, for a length of time, see death, section six, may present a prima facie case sufficient to warrant a grant of administration on his estate. Do you know I know a man who's 96 years old right now, and he's in prison. And he has been in prison since 1996. 1996, and he's 96 years old this year, and he's in prison. Let me tell you why he's in prison. First, he was head of the Hebrew National Society of America. Second of all, he was in the movies. And he was fairly famous. Third, he owned warehouses full of buses that he restored to perfection going clear back to the early 1900s and every time the movie industry needed a bus to make a 1916 movie he had some 1914 15s and 16 buses that got to play in the movie and they would rent those from him for considerable sums if you needed a double-decker bus from the 1950s, he had it. He had warehouses full of these buses, and he was quite wealthy. He had about $5 million offshore in the Cayman Islands that they didn't find. But what he did is he had two children, and he walked into the biggest law firm in the state he was in to get trust set up for his two children so they'd be taken care of for the rest of his life. And he took with him his accountant because he trusted his accountant and he trusted his lawyers. And he walked in the door to get these two trusts set up for his children. And what ended up happening is one of the lawyers, and actually I'm going to say it was three of the lawyers. Two, one of those lawyers is now dead. One of those lawyers is now in prison. And the other lawyer, well, we don't know where he is. But out of the three lawyers who sat down from this law firm with him, one of them had a lady in the town who was always in trouble. And she had been a prostitute for a number of years, and she had a 17-year-old daughter who was also a prostitute. And literally, the man wasn't even in, in town on the day of question, but all that evidence was 
subverted by the police department, who was probably paid very big by the lawyers, because evidence they had to exonerate him was never found or produced until a year ago we found the evidence. But those three lawyers set up him with a 17-year-old daughter while he was out of town and not involved himself personally, but they got some of his DNA off some things and uh, they set him up and they put him in prison for life. And he's living longer than they ever thought he would. But they did this and stole his entire estate except for the one big account that they couldn't find. He's in the jail in Albion, Pennsylvania. All of his warehouses gone. They auctioned them off at sheriff's auctions. They sold some of those, all those buses. They sold them all. They stole every dime he had in America, his beautiful home, all his kids' money. Inheritance never wrote the trust for the two children. And he had a 50,000 retainer to the, to the lawyers just to be on retainer for any time he needed them. And he kept that account maintained. So as they'd use it up, he'd refill it. And they put him in prison for life and to steal his estate. And I'm going to tell you something that could happen to anybody. In fact, I've seen it happen to so many, it makes me sick. You know why there's so many lawyers in Florida? Because there's so many old people with money. Sharks. It makes me sick. We've got to bring the bar down. We got to do what Oregon just did a little bit. That's a start, just a small step. We got to go more in depth than that. We got to stop it. That doesn't mean that we don't have lawyers. Lawyer is a law sayer. So in that case, I guess I'm a lawyer, but I'm not an attorney. I'm not an actor to a turn an actor pretending and practicing law. There's a big difference between outlaw and in-law. In-law is real, outlaw is false and a fallacy. Are your lawyers, your attorneys practicing outlaw or in-law? Hmm? Yeah, but that's in-law. Yeah, in fact is in law, okay? It's a fact of law. See, law is beautiful. It's black and white. It says what it says and it doesn't say what it doesn't say. It's clear and it's concise and it has meaning. Even in poorly written babble, it has meaning. <clears throat> they don't operate off this fact. They operate off case law. What is case law? It's a opine, it's opinion. Some judge wrote an opinion of law. In fact, lots of judges write opinions of law every single day. And lawyers are taught what, Sadie, in school, in law school? Statutory law and case law. Yeah. 
case law, case law, case law, case law, case law. That's opinion, 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 opinion. If you want to learn truth, are you going to listen to somebody's opinion? That's all I'm saying. That's what we got to be. We, this is what we got to wake up to. The arising of such presumption does not take the case out of the operation of the general rule on the subject. And if it is made to appear that the person was in fact alive at the time such an administration was granted, the administration is absolutely void. Sometimes my own wife bothers me. No, she's so smart. Man, she knows a lot. She doesn't have access to a big law library where she's at. She doesn't have access to it. And yet every day she's rattling off law to me. She's got it in here. She's read hundreds of thousands of law books. And it's all here and it's stored. I don't know how she does that. <laughs> but the problem is the cases that she has, she rattles off the law, which is truth and fact, and they don't give a shit. The courts don't care about truth and fact. Their motto is no fact or truth shall be tried in court. Now facts are important, we've got to put the fact on the record. We've got to put what happened on the record, we've got to have an affidavit on there, and they won't rebut it. That sets them up, helps set them up at the window. But it's all the other stuff they do. So about the tree again that I started mentioning yesterday, you whack away at the branches. The branches are the truth and the facts. And you trim the tree and you prune it. And it grows stronger. Harder to pull out of the ground. All right? If you cut the roots, especially if you can work your way under and cut the tap root, so the taproot is their authority to act in the first place. Understand that. The taproot of the tree is the authority to act in the first place. We all, including Bonnie, goes into court thinking that someone is righteous enough to see the facts, the branches, and she whacks away at the branches and she proves the tree and the case gets stronger against her because she thinks somebody's going to listen to that. And their motto, you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So you put yourself in their shoes and you go, well, okay, make me stronger. Facts are the truth don't matter to me, but if you want to go ahead and throw that out there and trim my tree, make me stronger and prune me, that's okay. I'll take it. And the whole time I'm taking it, I'm going to grow my trunk bigger and my roots deeper. And that's what they do. And the reason I'm telling you like this is to make you understand that that's how they continue to get your consent and jurisdiction. And they build that taproot, their authority to rule over you. They build that and they grow that bigger, stronger, deeper. Well, you're preoccupied with the branches of the tree. And as you're preoccupied, you're making mistakes, little ones here and there, and you're giving your consent, and you're, you're giving them more authority. Is this making sense? So the tree gets bigger. So you've got to first chop at the roots to get to the taproot. You can't just get to the taproot all on its own. There's roots going out every which way around it. What are those roots? Okay, the 
taproot is merely whether you're alive or dead. That's it. They determine you're alive, the tree dies, it falls over. It's over with. It's done. That's the taproot. But the other roots that you got to chop away at and get to, whether you're alive or dead, because this one you got to do on the outside before you get there. <laughs> Status, standing, jurisdiction, all their authoritative processes. Which law are they using? What kind of court are they? Are, are you walking into a federal district court that's an Article Three court with an Article Three judge? Because you can walk in the same damn building to, into the same darn courtroom and have a magistrate judge. Do you know which type of judge you have? That's a root of the tree. You've got to figure out that root. Make sure you have the right one and cut the other one off. See? That's just one thing. you got to assume in the lower court you're going to fail. I always go into a county courtroom thinking I'm going to fail. But if I'm going to fail, and i got to win, and eventually I've got to set them up at the window. It's just like going through a Dutch Brothers drive through yeah, you got to get out there to that sign or get somebody to walk out with that clipboard and you got to order what you need. And then it comes out mighty tasty. <laughs> See, you, but you got to set it up at the window. So when you get to the window, you get the right thing. Right. This is why we have to know our courts. This is why I'm going to harp on it a little bit this weekend. Do you know your courts yet? Got the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Do you know there's courts above that? Do you know one of the most powerful courts we can go to is located in his country, Belgium? Can I pick on you for a minute? Are you using U.S. law in Belgium? I can ask the same person in Germany who is in the same position as this man who's been following this movement for a long time and knows his crap. I can ask the same person in Germany. In Germany, are you using U.S. law? He's gonna, they're going to say yes. What's that? Yep. Yeah, he chases judges from the courtroom. <laughs> He's, he wants to rally his people. He calls the mayor. Says, hey, keep your cops away from us. We're going to be rallying, right? <laughs> Say that one more time louder. No cops to be seen for miles. He calls the mayor and tells him to call him off. They don't want the trouble. They don't want any trouble. <laughs> no, because he's using U.S. law and he's beating the crap out of them. Because they have to go by it. The United States runs all these countries. They run them all under international treaty. And I can fly over to The Hague, into the court there in The Hague, and stop all this crap sometimes. And we could do that. It's not quite the mission I'm on yet, but it's getting there. It's getting there. I have to work through every bit every step i can't climb the steps and jump a section but if we do it right and we work our way up there we're going to change the world but see the world will not change without the people it will not president trump can't do it 
He said it before. He's told you all. He gave all the power to you. He signed a whole bunch of executive orders that gave you guys the power to do this stuff. And Biden has no authority to take those orders away, and he hasn't. And he knows he doesn't have it. Well, you get up here. <laughs> this man knows more about American money than you guys do. I also want to say, because he just said that the people got to comply, even the, the minister from Rutte, from Dutch, from Holland, he also said, live on TV, as long as the people take it, we will keep going. He said it live. He said, as long as the people just keep doing, we're just going to keep going. As long as we don't stand up, nothing's going to change. So, and that was live. <laughs> I just want to come back because I've got a microphone now. When I went to the, the first... No, <laughs> no. When I, when I did, because it's, it's funny, you know, about three years ago, I was like a normal person doing my restaurant, listen to all the drunk people in the restaurant saying this and that, and then they shut us down. Yeah, through COVID, I didn't shut my place down. I did, I did comply for the first two weeks, and then I was watching Netflix till the middle of the night and just getting bored of eating crisps and all this, and I'm thinking, this is not right. Then I started to open a laptop, and then I said, oh, this is not correct, and that's not correct. Then I started getting the message out like a stupid little nervous boy on, on, on Facebook and telling what's happening. And then I started getting involved with people, like I said, about Ron Gibson. Three o'clock in the middle of the night, well, my time, it was not what 12 o'clock in the, in the afternoon for him and the, he left his number on his on this program like david Strait does i said i've got to ring this guy in the middle of the night and then i got involved with ron gibson and like i said 12 that 12 days i drove all around and i got involved with common law and i've learned more in the last year and a half in opening the books that i ever did when i went to school because I was the one at school that said he wants, he can do it, but he don't want to. That means in my head, there must be something wrong. But I, I never, never, ever always went to school. I had to get 50%. I got 51. That was enough. I didn't want to get 70, 80%. But when I went also for the first time, I took up the books. I was shaken to go into the courthouse and saying, look, and the funny thing as well, because I had four, at the time, I only had 40, 50 people behind me supporting me to go into the courthouse because I didn't want to wear the masks. And I didn't want to say, I'll ask you for your passport or your ID, or you can only come in with a QR code. I didn't do all that. I said, if you want me to do your job, you got to give me a policy jacket and I'll sit there. You give me your money and then I'll do your job. But I haven't got the right. I'm not a doctor. So then I went to the courthouse and I was outside and you can find this all live on YouTube with the pictures um, uh, on Internet. I mean, if you got and we went there with 50 people behind us and the police it was all there in front of us with the masks. And that was on the Friday and the Monday you were not allowed to. They said you can't don't have to wear a mask anymore. So they said I didn't appear in the courthouse. That's the first time. But I was outside, the press was there, and the judge then sentenced me while I'm not in the courthouse for 16 days imprisonment. I had to pay 6,000 euros fine. I said, how can you sentence me if I'm not even in the courthouse? So then we had to go a higher appeal, and then I had to go to Ghent. But the judge that sentenced me, I took the common law and I took him to court because he's not allowed to sentence somebody if you're not in the courthouse. That's a, 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 a sentence also for 20 years that he's got to go to prison. So we took him. <clears throat> <clears throat> so then we went to the uh, correctional court in Ghent. I also subpoenaed the judge that gave me the sentence. He had to be there. 
he didn't turn up. But I played it the smart way because I know they always wanted to get you aggression. So I went alone with my good friend. And we went alone in the courthouse. The police was there. They were walking down the hallway. There was a lot of police. And then there was one of them who said, hi, Hans. And the other two just were like that. So then I went inside. And it's like I said, it's so weird. You go in a courthouse because you always look up to the, well, not saying look up to judges and police because you're afraid of them. But once you walk into the courthouse and they always wanted me to go in front of the thing with all the when you get convicted, it's like a little flappy thing where you walk through, yeah? The, I don't know how to translate that in America, so. The gate, the bar, I said, so you wanna go? I said, no, I'm fine here. By the way, I'm Hans, I'm here to support Mr. Blankart in big letters. And he asked me three times, I said, I'm not doing it. So the first judge stood up, I said, oh, I'm not having all this. He walked out, then the, the judge on the left-hand side, he looked at the one in the middle and then he stood up as well. And then the third one, while they were at the door walking out, he was giving them signs that he had to leave. So I'm there, I'm seeing the three judges that I'm supposed to be afraid of because they do all the rights or whatever, stand up, leave the courthouse. And I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I let it sink in for two minutes. I sat down and then I stood up and then I said to the clerk, okay, this is this case dismissed. And then uh, the, the, the captain has left the ship and the case dismissed. And I turned around to the, to the people from the, from the newspapers and I said to them, and you write the truth. And I walked out. <clears throat> And that's how I got my case dismissed. But I had to do it myself. The next day, within the 20, uh, within 48 hours, I had to put the cases down and did everything like that. And people asked me like this, there was a woman here, says, how do you stand up? And like I said, to, I understand where he comes from because a couple of weeks ago, I rang him and he didn't ring me back. And he said <laughs> he had a tough time. And I can understand. And this is not being big header because I got my club I got a restaurant now at the moment it's 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 still open everybody's still fighting but I got times that I'm in my room because also I also spoke to the lawyer yesterday he said are you are you single I said no my ex-wife <coughs> cheated on me and then she vaccinated my children <coughs> and the words he said is I'll even if I have to pay for them I'll still vaccinate you just to piss you off but that was two two, two years ago and now it's 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 it is what it is like i said but i just want to say people said you want to stand up it starts with yourself if you speak to the person next to you it's two of them and many people always say we're alone you're not alone if everybody just says we're not alone and we all stand up and in belgium then you got 11.5 million people standing up and that's what counts and that's how you get the people on the streets and everybody's here are doing the, the the things that he's learning from him speak to your neighbor and i know it's hard where's the guy with the cowboy hat the blue guy with the he's over there he's hiding he said he lives in a town as well and nobody listens but if you just keep talking talking to everybody else we'll get there and then we'll all stand up and you got to do it from your heart like i said i've got nights that i'm crying really crying on my sofa and I also ask why do I I don't have to do this I can go home and play try and get do something else instead of trying people but there's something pushing and I see it in this guy and I saw it the last time we went the first time we went in in Tennessee and that's what drives and if we all can do the same we're gonna get there simple as that Okay. Okay, we're going to go to one and uh, then break for lunch. So stop me at one. What do you need? Okay. So um, I just want to remind everybody that Olga um, is doing her uh, uh, frequency. Okay. She, Olga's doing her regenu out there. I suggest you you uh go do that that machine keeps me alive 
I want you to know that. I'll tell you, I, uh, my body's rejecting some titanium right now, and it does that from time to time. It kind of tries to spit it out of my body. And uh, no, I'm not Terminator. <laughs> but it starts to reject it. And I can get on that machine. I don't put any input into it. I don't tell it what it is. It tests 1,700 points on my body. And it tells me exactly what I already knew that's wrong with me. And it always picks it out. It knows what's wrong with you every single time. And it can be a many different things. And it knows what's wrong with you. And then it fixes it with frequency. If you're quick, we got to get rolling. So here, right here. So about three weeks ago, I was on one of those machines. Closer to your mouth, like that. About three weeks ago, I was on one of those machines that David has, the same one that Olga has. And he did one of those scans on me, and then he did a frequency thing. After he was done, I said, by the way, what did it show? And he said, your body was perfect, except you have some kind of a latent um, stomach issue. And I thought, wow, I don't have any kind of a stomach issue. I don't remember any stomach issue. And then about a day later, because that was bothering me, I remembered my stomach issue. Listen to this. When I was about 23 or 24 years old, I suddenly developed a perforated ulcer. I couldn't breathe. I was perforated ulcer. I had no idea what was wrong with me. Went to the emergency room, I remember it was a Sunday morning, and they examined me and they said, you need immediate surgery, et cetera, et cetera. At the time, I was like 23, 24 years old. It so happened that I was working for a medical doctor who had become a medical hypnotist. And I had no money, and they wanted, the hospital wanted me to pay him. I had no insurance. I called him, he was my boss, and I said, Hey, I'm in the hospital. This is what's wrong with me. He said, I'll be right over. He came over about 20 minutes later, and he examined me. He looked at the work, the blood work and all that stuff. He said, yep, yeah, you have a perforated ulcer. And I was like in tears. I couldn't breathe. And I said, what do I do? And he said, you have two choices. I'll pay for your surgery, and you can have that done now. Or you can get in the car with me right now, go to the office, and I will do some medical hypnosis on you. And if it doesn't work, I'll still pay for you to come back and have the surgery. Well, that was a win-win. I went to his office, or our office. I thought I had been under medical hypnosis at that time for maybe five minutes. It was over two hours when I woke up. And when I woke up, I was breathing perfectly fine. And all I had was like, um, like a muscle cramp, a muscle cramp. That was all that I had. And I looked and I said, what was that all about? And he said, well, <clears throat> I gave you a post-hypnotic uh, suggestion. I cured the muscle, the, the, the ulcer, with the hypnosis, and I gave you a post-hypnotic suggestion because you carry all of your nerves in your stomach. Whenever you get upset, it's in your stomach. So for the future, if you ever are in a position where you are nervous, it will always affect your stomach. And the post-hypnotic suggestion is there to make sure that it never turns into a perforated ulcer again. And that is what that machine found was the latent stomach issue that I had. That machine is unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to share that. Okay. All right. Also, you, you've got Tressa doing massage, and you've got available to you a med bed to schedule. So, there are still spots for, uh, for the med bed. Uh, yeah, we shouldn't call it a med bed. It's a frequency bed. Yeah, frequency bed, quantum bed. So, um, so if you want to 
schedule. Please come and and uh, they are staying late this evening oh. up until about 11. So uh, before they head back to Minnesota. So uh, please feel free to come by. I am right back in the corner over here and we're having support. And also, I really want to encourage you to sign up with Freeman Bond. That system and getting better all the time that's that's what we all got to strive for just continue to get better and one last thing i am going to be sending this book around um so anyone who uh, wants to participate in the community service and help support the community um you know, uh, trafficking or or um, uh, mortgage issues or what have you. Um, just go ahead and just like make a little comment, and um, we're gonna be working, reaching out and working with people so you can support. So, thank you. Okay. These courts, they're always administering your estate. Everything they do. Please, these are the things I work hard to keep in the back of my own mind. A court is always a bank. A judge and a court clerk are always a banker. They're, a bank is in the business of creating a security and nothing else. Please keep that in mind. Every officer, every agent of government creates a cause of action. The cause of action creates a case number when they take you out of it. Remember who you are. Are you a you? No, if I said, hey, you, who's going to answer? Let me tell you what the judge does. John Smith, you owe $2,500. John Smith, you are charged. John Smith, you must bond. Is what? Is the debtor. The definite legal definition of the word you in law is one who owes a debt to the United States. One who owes a debt to the United States. Who is the United States? It's a corporation. It's Germany. It's Belgium. It's Mexico. It's Canada. It's Colorado. California, New York, Florida, Texas. The United States is the Philippines. The United States is Guam. It's the Virgin Islands. It's Ireland. It's England. The United States is 196 nation states. It's Australia, it's New Zealand, it's everyone who has signed on. Everyone. The positions of power in the world has changed in the last five years. The Vatican is no longer in control. Through the crown, through the city of London, through the District of Columbia, they no longer run the UN. The United Nations is 196 nation states controlled by the stakeholders of WEF, the WHO, the CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services. There's no country government anywhere in the world. They're ghost ships. They are. That's a great term. 
because that's what they are. They're pirated ghost ships. And guess what we're doing as people? We're taking it back. We're taking the booty. We are. Virginia, go to their court's judicial website, and it says they're common law courts now. She's got a case there right now. Well, Gore, uh, Judge Clarence Thomas made the announcement. Gorsuch has already written the orders. It's already done. The bar has to go to the sidelines. They've got to back up. They've got to go away. And that's the beauty of the whole thing. Does that mean they have to stop practicing law? No, it doesn't. But their oath to the bar goes away. They have a minor oath to the Constitution, which we're making the major oath. See, it's always been with the Bar Association, with the attorneys and the lawyers and judges, that the bar was their superior oath. And then they took minor oaths. But when one oath interferes with the other, they revert to the higher oath. So they always revert to the oath of the bar. And that's why judges have got away with so much, because they can always go to that and do whatever it is they want to do. And they can overrule the rule of law. But President Trump brought back the rule of law, and it's taken time to change. And it didn't change at all through government. You've got to understand that. Government makes things possible and opens the doors for the people to walk through. And when the people walk through the door, that's when they affect the change. Without the people, they're dictators. You understand that? America always looks for a leader to change things for them. Well, we sit on our ass and do nothing and watch football. That ain't never going to happen. The world will never change. The people got to rise up and change. That's why the books for the sheriffs and the police officers are so important. I remember years and years and years ago when... 3,300-plus sheriff's manuals, constitutional sheriff's manuals, were mailed to every county sheriff in the United States. It costs hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to put those sheriff's manuals together. It costs a whole lot more to mail them. But it's what we could afford to do. But it only went to the sheriffs. So then it was up to a sheriff whether he even read it or not. And then it was up to him whether he instilled it in his deputies or not, or whether he stood up against his district attorney in the county attorney or not. See? And that's where the ball got dropped for most of them. So the effect of thousands of dollars of quite a few people working on it, went to 3,144 sheriffs. How many of those read it? Maybe 700. In fact, we pretty much know the numbers. Out of the 700, how many instilled it into their deputies? No, it was less than 100. We were actually probably right around 90. So 90 of those sheriffs took it to heart and instilled it in their deputies. How many stood up against their county attorneys and their DAs? How many of them walk in? There was a few. There really was. How many of and most of them are in the liberal states? 
Good conservative sheriffs in liberal states do more than conservative sheriffs in conservative states. You know why? They're more pissed off. I'm serious. I know a, a county, one county, that's bigger than all of Rhode Island and part of Connecticut in a state out west that has less people than this town has in it in the entire area it's, it's a, a lot of square miles in one county here you tend to have little tiny counties there how west we have big counties and we have big counties with seven thousand people in them we got where there's more cows in a square mile than there are people in a square mile by far okay and i know a sheriff out in one of those counties that took everything about the constitution so serious that he put ex explosives on the bridges of every road leading into the county that he could detonate with his phone should the feds come in he could blow the bridges and protect his people. And he deputized every able-bodied man in the county. He deputized them, made them all deputies. And every one of them was armed and ready. And they had comms, communications, where one number the sheriff would call and everyone's phone went off and everybody jumped in their pickup trucks see that's a sheriff with a border policy <laughs> okay When you got one that cares about his people so much, he'll blow the bridges into the county. That's a sheriff that cares. Well, now everybody knows, you know. Okay. I was in intelligence work. And you gave me enough clues. Well, they look at my mouth. I called him because there was a warrant for a written system that was not signed by the judge. I asked him, are your deputies going to enforce this? I explained to him the whole thing. I said, sir, are you going to violate my rights that are protected by the Constitution if you took an oath to just because the judge orders it without signing the oath that I'll do whatever that judge does? Yeah, that's a true story. And they did. And I got it all. I'm going to go back after them. If that's okay. Uh, here's, here's a fact I want you to understand about what he just said. First of all, a judge goes to work in a little car and he goes into a courthouse. And that's where his office is uh, in the back, in his what's called chambers. And he sits there and he can sit there all day long and he can write paper. And he can sign the order or not sign the order. And whatever it is that he writes, whatever order he signs, whatever warrant he signs, it doesn't matter. If it isn't enforced, it's a piece of paper on the ground. It means nothing. It's nothing if it's not enforced. That sheriff has the right to do what is right or wrong. That sheriff has more authority than that judge. 
deputy and I said, you go get it signed, I will follow it to the letter. And he took it, and he took it back, he came back a few hours later, unsigned, and he's like, I guess they're pretty uh, stingy with their signature. I said, sir, are you telling me in front of witnesses, if I do not leave, you're going to arrest me? He said, yes, I am. I said, under arrest? And when two witnesses, I got in my truck and I left my property. I'm going to tell you a little story about a friend of mine. He used to live right up next to my big ranch in eastern Oregon. And this man had the same exact thing happen to him. And he didn't leave. And the sheriff arrested him. Yeah. Well, the sheriff arrested him for contempt of a court order in the state of oregon that is a variable number of days not all states you have to go by your state law okay contempt in texas is 30 days contempt in oregon the first time is seven days <clears throat> so the sheriff threw him in jail and he sat there for seven days sheriff lets him out the door where does he go he went home, told the sheriff, I'm going home, and he went home. Sheriff came back that night, and he arrested him. And in Oregon, it's bearable. The contempt charge for the second offense is 14 days. And he sat there for 14 days. And he gets done with his 14 days, and the sheriff opens the door, and he says, I'm going home. And he went home. And the sheriff showed up at his house and arrested him. And the third contempt charge for the same offense is 30 days. And he sat there for 30 days. Sheriff opens the door and he says, I'm going home. And the sheriff looks at him and says, John, I won't be coming to your house tonight. That man is still in his house. No bank has taken it. No court has taken his house. Because court orders that are unconstitutional are null and void. But how much time do you have to spend in jail? One month and three weeks. He spent a total of seven weeks in jail, eating three lousy meals a day at odd hours, because they feed you breakfast like 4.30 in the morning. And he spent that much time in jail, but he didn't lose his house. And he still lives there today. The rule of three applies in everything. Everything we do, the rule of three applies. And if we're strong enough, and we're not weak, and we stand three times on everything that we do, we will win. Most people aren't willing to pay the price. Civilly dead, dead in the view of the law, the condition of one who has lost his civil rights and capacities and is counted dead in the law. That's a court case called Razor, or Rassor, maybe, R A S O R versus Rassor. It means to be civilitor mortus. Civilitor mortus, civilly dead. Okay? Civil death is a change in a person's legal and civil condition. And this is Black's Law First Edition from 1891. This is the definition. 
question. Civil death, the change in a person's legal and civil condition which deprives him of civic rights and juris, jurisdictional capacities and qualifications as natural death extinguishes his natural condition and not his civil condition. It falls as a consequence of being attained of treason or felony in English law and anciently of entering a monastery or abjuring the realm the person in this condition is to said to be civilator mortis or civilly dead or dead in the law all you had to do is enter a court or a monastery and you're civilly dead that's most churches by the way Well, guess what the Social Security Administration has for us all? If you were would to read the employee manual. Nobody reads the Social Security's employee manual. That's not for humans to do unless you work for the Social Security Administration. <sighs> A policy for presumption of death of a missing person. Oh my gosh, you guys. Once you have your, here's, here's how they speed shit up. I will, government always finds a way to get better too. So we got to find a way to get better to combat them. So you're born, you get a, birth certificate on the last day of the seventh year eighth birthday they declare you dead somebody in that county you were born in declared you dead they either did an affidavit if it was before 2009 right on the death certificate which is attached to the long form birth certificate it actually is numbered on your birth certificate one through about 34 some of them 28 and, but they're changing the forms to all be standard now. So eventually, it'll be the same in every state, wherever you go, in every county, and whatever state, including the state of Germany, the state of Belgium, the state of what they're all states of the United States under the District of Columbia's rule. See, really under DHHS and the CDC and the who it's rule. You gotta understand that hierarchy a little bit. So the death portion of it is subsequent numbers. So if the birth certificate ended with 34, it starts at 35. It's part of the same form. Where's Miranda? She would tell me exactly, but I think there were, uh, I think if I remember right, there's 54 boxes on the real vital statistics birth and death record, which the name of that is what? Thank you. Certified confidential birth, death, vital statistics record. So your birth and your death is already there. So what are you? Civilator mortus. You're civilly dead. You're not naturally dead because I could pinch you and it's going to hurt. See, you're not a zombie. You're breathing. You have a heartbeat. You're not naturally dead but you're civilly dead and there's a big difference between the two when you bring a friend okay so right in their own manual here it says if a policy for presumption of death of a missing person established the, da the date of presumed death on the last day of the seven-year period. <sighs> if any situation exists other than those listed, and they put the code here, GN00304.050B.6.A.0, point point in this section, establish the date of death as the last day of the seventh year period, beginning with the date of disappearance. 
What's the date of disappearance? The date your mother was discharged you from the hospital. Why do you think they kick you out so fast? <laughs> oh, golly. For example, if John were missing as of August 7th of 1990, we established their date of death as August 7th of 1997. If only the fact of death is material, presume the date of death be the last day of the seven-year period. Now, if you get a Social Security card at birth, it speeds up the time frame because you become an employee. Now, you're kind of little and your diaper needs changed and you eat and that's it. <laughs> but if an employee is missing for two years, <laughs> you're, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. An appearance. Look, if this was a veil, right, and I hid behind the veil, I got to appear and in court. That's right. And you got to have the lawyers because they can't understand the living. They can't hear the living. The living speaks babble. Makes, makes me so mad. What? Yes. If you put it on there. Okay. If you put it on your paper, your paper can make a legal appearance for you. Huh? Yes. You have to put the statement on your paper. And also on the back. <laughs> see, the judge holds it up like this, and he goes, I don't see it here. What's he looking at? That happened to him, by the way. And I've been saying that in my classes for years. You know what I do on the backs of my papers? I put Bible verses. The funny thing is that never makes it onto the docket. When they, when they scan the documents and put it on the docket, they only scan the front page. This is why you have to serve the prosecutor and the judge. If you serve the prosecutor and the judge, and it's got the script, their copy has the scriptures on there. Guess what they got to go by? They have to actually make an attempt to contact the dead. It says that right here in their manual. Yeah, attempt to contact the missing person. You must, as an employee of the Social Security Administration, try to contact the missing person by contacting the most recent employer listed on the detail earnings query platform to request and read the DEQY, follow the instructions in MSOM queries 003.005. I'm going to tell you, it's fun to read this shit. Because you can read one paragraph like I just did. And you know how many things in order to do your adequate research you've got to do? You've got to go look at those things. And then you've got to go back and look at each word and make sure the definitions are correct. Not, not every word, but you can pick out two or three that you have to know. And that's the way government writes stuff. And how many people follow that? How many people do those things? Nobody. Nobody hardly. It's so few. 
Then you got to check with the Internal Revenue Service and see whether any wages have been paid to that employee while he's been missing. It's pretty interesting. No, not really, does he? So then they don't find any wages for him. Now he's lost at sea. Ship went down. And they're going to make that presumption of death. Now he's civilitor mortus until he's 96 years old and comes to a David Strait class. You see what I mean? And figures it out and changes it. This kind of stuff drives me batty. Drives me crazy. And you know why? Because there was no disclosure of the terms and conditions of the contract. That's what it boils down to. Everything is contractual. Your Honor, I'm fully unaware of any contract that could compel me to perform. If there is such contract, bring it forward. And we'll follow it to the full extent of the law. But if there's not, then we're done here. Bring the birth. And, see, once we know, we can bring it up. Bring me the uh, certified confidential birth and death vital statistics record, Your Honor, and let's uh, let's see if that's a legitimate contract. Show me my wedding signature when I was over the age of 18, where all the terms and conditions were clearly explained to me, and I agreed with full and honest disclosure, okay, where I gave my consent where there was a monetary consideration. See, the only monetary consideration is there on their part. They monetized it, created a bond, sold that bond over and over and over again until they built up that account to $100 million guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. And who is the United States? Even Belgium and Germany. Every state, every country, 196 countries are considered United States. Under the United Nations. See, they should have just take that word nation off and write the word state and you'd all understand. But that's how they made it so you didn't understand. But see, they all joined together under treaty, under compact, just like we did with the Articles of Confederation. Articles, that's your corporate charter. Corporate charter. So in 1789, the Articles of Confederation, corporate charter. Or was it 1787? All right, guys. You want a break for lunch? Quick question, real quick. Yeah, they're all dead. And they could sue them. The minute they took an oath, they're dead. And they know that. That they're dead. They wear a black robe. All right, everybody, come in and sit down. <clears throat> You're welcome. Thank you.
Hey, Neil, is there speakers out in the front so they they know when we're getting started? Tell everybody out there we're getting started. <clears throat> I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to hear out there when everybody's talking. <clears throat> And here it goes. I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> right? This is how you access your trust. Yeah, this is how you access your trust. And I, I was going to say for later, but I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> you know, in, uh, <clears throat> in all the time I've been doing this, I've never done it for that reason, you know? To me, it is not about money. But you gotta understand the reason why. For 30 plus years, being part of what Reagan got me into, <clears throat> this part of the, the government that uh, really didn't exist as far as people knew and has now kind of been become run by the cabal it was started out as very righteous it was known as a shadow government there's about 40,000 people as part of it and uh it wasn't based out of Washington, D.C. Nobody worked for the government as a like employee or <clears throat> it was all because we wanted America to be free. So everybody that did it, did it because the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, was a very, um, we felt very honest and righteous man. And he set it up to save America. Of course, back in those days, during Reagan's time, what was going on in the world, right? We'd just gotten over the Cuban Missile Crisis from the Kennedys and, and Johnsons and Nixons and stuff, right into Vietnam and all that bull crap. And, all kinds of bad things happen with oil embargoes and the dollar all over the place going haywire and the vast majority of our inflation rates happened during those times <clears throat> you know and uh all, all that stuff happened and uh we had you know that was the taking down of the berlin wall time and the war on drugs in Panama and and uh, and uh, the South American countries, all those things were happening during that period of history. And it was a rough period of time for the United States and all kinds of things could have happened that could have made it go very, very, very haywire and uh, um, could have been destructive to the American people in a in a big way and so what he did is created a a government outside of the district of columbia people who were well trained in many various positions who could stand up and take over say if a nuclear weapon was dropped in the middle of dc during a congressional session. <laughs> and so <clears throat> many of those people did a lot of great things for this country that nobody knows about. It was never talked about. It wasn't on reports. Um, <laughs> Yeah.
It didn't even make classified documents. I mean, literally was a, uh, a system of people who did things around the world to keep Americans alive and safe and to prepare for the future. And I'm going to tell you something and I'll probably get in trouble a little bit. And a lot of people aren't going to going to understand because of the controversial nature of the whole thing. But John F. Kennedy started the Q program. Look at his grave at Arlington. OK. Was he buried in that grave? Yes, but not until recently. He didn't die in 1963 in November. He died in 2021. A lot of things people don't know that are just coming out. How many people have seen the video of LBJ's driver who drove Kennedy that day turn around and shoot him? It's crystal clear. You think that was the only bullet that was fired out? They came from all kinds of different places. One place I'll guarantee they didn't come from is the depository. Okay, didn't come from there. <clears throat> so there's some uh, some very interesting things with that and with uh, what's taken place since. And a lot of it has been to prepare for today and tomorrow. None of what you know about child trafficking or human trafficking would even be out there in place if it wasn't for things that have been done because of Reagan. He didn't even live to live long enough to see it. But he did a lot of things that helped us, things that are still helping us. And he's not the only one. He's just one of many. But he had foresight that was incredible. Or maybe he had a system that gave him foresight. See, Reagan was president in 1986, right? That was during his presidency. And in 1986, there's reports out from the Department of Defense on plasma generated, call it space time continuum. Okay. And their final reports, and the DOD doesn't have final reports until it's tested and proven. Otherwise, it's an experiment, it doesn't get finals. So there's a lot of things people don't know. And I think it's all being revealed to you now, right now. And these things are, uh, can make you look like the biggest conspiracy idiot there is when you talk about them. My definition of a conspiracy theorist is six months. Yeah, anything you think is a conspiracy theory that comes out today, it'll be proven in six months. <clears throat> and that's that's the way it is. So, and that has to do with every aspect of the world. All the committee of 300, all the banks, all the bank accounts, what's happening, almost every bank's going to fail. The ones that survive, we already know which ones those are going to be. And the ones that survive won't be banks anymore. They will be financial service centers. Okay. Banking as we know it is over with. Hallelujah. It's over. Yep. It's going to take a little time to end, but it's over. Okay.
and things are changing and they're changing fast and whether you know it or not the the foreign currency exchange is already beginning it's already starting and it's already you can watch it sit there and watch it go up right now and as it moves closer see it takes time everybody wants it to happen yesterday instant gratification that's american population we want it right now i want it right now i am very impatient you guys okay this has been the struggle of my life for 30 years get it done <laughs> okay they would have hated me as a president you guys would have hung me if i would have been president because i would have walked in on the first day and in, within the first week i would have solved all the freaking world problems and been done because I know what they are. But see, politicians in that manner, they know it's more complicated. The reason they know it's more complicated because look at the great politicians of the world over the history. You know, Caesar was a great politician. Julius Caesar was a great politician. And when I say that, I don't mean like politicians like Reagan or Kennedy or President Trump. Those are great men. I'm talking about politicians like Stalin and Hitler and Mao. See, they were more like me. They just wanted to get in and get it done, get the problem solved. We got a usury problem in our country and our our people are getting screwed and there's this other group of people over here who is screwing our people and they're foreclosing on their houses they're loaning money they can't repay and they're they're taxing them to, to death in ways that are wrong so let's go hang them go kill them that was Stalin and Hitler, beloved by their people, hated by the world because they were known as dictators, right? To commit a genocide. Was Hitler right in the beginning that he couldn't tell one Jew from another Jew? See, there's a big difference about being a Jew and being Jewish. The Jews aren't bad people. Jewish, on the other hand, well, you can be a Catholic and be Catholic-ish. <laughs> right? Doesn't matter. Hey, Father Earl, would you come up for me for a bit? Can I pick on you? Will you say a prayer for us today? Rob, you got that other mic? Okay, just to clarify, I'm not Roman Catholic. No, I'm, he's not. I'm Greek Orthodox. But <laughs> in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and pillar of all things, treasury of blessings, a giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O gracious Lord. I mean, yeah. well, I'm going to append it just a little bit. Lord, thank you for um, bringing us here. For no one is here that it's not here for a reason. You know the reason. Please enlighten each person that they know the reason. Uh, you've put David and Bonnie in a place that they could affect this nation. Help us be um, the people that do that which you call him and us to do. Uh, let America be changed for your glory, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever the age of ages. Oh, I just felt like I needed that. Let me tell you something. I've I've studied a lot of history and I've studied all religions, and 
every one of them have principles that will lead you to God. Are they all correct? No. Because they were, most of them were developed by man over time. And uh, we've got beautiful people in every religion. The Greek Orthodox religion is a very, very old and ancient religion. And it's a whole lot closer to God than most of the ones out there right now. Okay. The Marcionite Bible, I'm not saying that right, I know, because I can't say it. But it was a, a, a Bible that was first published in 144 AD, 133 years after Christ's death, and, uh, and today being the Sabbath day, happy Sabbath. The Sabbath day, I've read that recently again, and it's uh, the story from about the death of Christ to a few years shortly thereafter, and it's basically New Testament, that Bible. The uh, I've reread the Dead Sea Scrolls recently too. A lot more accuracy in that than the Bibles we read today. The 54 complete Apocrypha books, I challenge every one of you to read them. All 54 books. I'm smiling because I know the history of how those books got out. And the meaning they have in our lives, especially today in the end times. You see, in the 1560s, I'm sorry, 1260s, in the 1260s, the very first Geneva Bible came out, and then it came out as again a reprint in 1599. Okay? I've, why am I saying 15? Will you guys just slap me a little bit? Wake me up? 1299. No. No, I'm all right. Man, I'll tell you what, guys. I'm having a tough time this weekend. I don't know if you've known it, but... Uh, I've got quite of an infection going on in my body right now. And I'm pretty wore out. And I'm tired. And so I was right the first time, 1560, 1599. All right. I correct myself here. And there was several thousand changes between those two versions of the Bible. The Greek Orthodox Bible came out way before that the Hebrew Bible before that, the Dead Sea Scrolls before that, the Geese Bible before that, okay, on and on. Back through history, the every time beginning in 1560 on, at least, every time there's been a, a reprint come out, more and more changes in God's Word, okay? Just between the 1611 King James Version and when it was revised about 18 years later, 20,000 words were changed. Verses have been left out. Heck, entire books have been left out. The NIV, man, I don't even want to tell you how bad that is. We've changed the English language. We've changed, added to the alphabet. Even Shakespeare said, talked about the letter Z and how it diminishes our standing with God. The English language is one of the worst languages in the history of mankind. And you know what they're doing to it now? Not only do they keep changing it, but 
they're changing our writing, our writing styles, which they really can't change, but they're doing it anyway. No longer cursive taught in school, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> it's a continuing dumbing down of the people. This stuff's got to stop. You guys got to stop it. These people out there, I'm watching people fight school boards around the country. I am so proud of them. They're doing such a good job. I watched a ex-prosecuting attorney on a video talking to his county council and basically cuss, cussing them out. And I watched the sheriff throw him from the room on video because that man once was evil he once was the cabal we talk about but he changed he woke up and he changed and he saw the wrong and he decided to speak out and he's being persecuted for it right now and that's okay we got to go get persecuted sometimes. Go get it done. What did I read you about consecration? What that means to give up everything if you have to. The most perfect of all God's laws, the one that saves your soul, is the one who gives it all for mankind. God doesn't take that lightly. Now, you might experience a little hell on earth getting it done, but your soul, don't worry about it. It'll be taken care of. It's how you earn your mansion in heaven. There are some great people in this movement, great people in this room who aren't doing enough. I'm going to challenge you all to do enough. Do more. Do more than enough. Wear yourself out. Now is the time. Hans last night at his dinner was talking about Europe being told about what's coming in, in September. And here in the United States, there are intelligence reports where they're talking about what's coming in July and September. All kinds of things coming. A lot of you th th see things and people saying th things that are coming and, you know, last November and they didn't happen. Well, let me tell you something. Even if that one thing didn't happen, enough happened in November that you probably missed that was a real big deal. And what it's doing is it's adding up. It's like dominoes falling. And it's adding up and it's adding up. And the people who are standing up, their vibration levels, their knowledge, their, their brain is opening and it is causing the vibration of the earth to change. How many of you felt an earthquake here last night? I'm going to tell you about a couple of weeks ago, there was eight earthquakes in Oklahoma in one day. Now, Bonnie gets this little propaganda news thing on an iPad that the government feeds the prisoners news so they know what's going on in the world while they're inside. Okay. And she says, there was a 3.1 earthquake in China. I said, there were eight of them much bigger than that in Oklahoma on the state next to you that they didn't tell you about. Why? And they were bigger here, eight of them, bigger than the one in China they told her about. 
the news media. And then I went on to tell her there were 10,381 earthquakes yesterday in the world. Yesterday. The plates are breaking up. The mantle is breaking into pieces so it can absorb shock. Understand that. The West Coast will dive under the Pacific plate. The United Nations is building an inland port above the elevation of Salt Lake City. It's a shipping port designed to replace the shipping ports of Tacoma, Oakland, Long Beach, Portland, Seattle. You think they don't know what's going to happen in the future? Do you think they haven't found a way to see into the future? Jerry, can I pick on you? He said yes. What's in? Come up here. Seriously, come up here. Oh, well, it's because I love you. <laughs> All right. What's in Tulsa, downtown Tulsa, the artwork? Yeah. Testing. Okay. There's a place in uh, downtown Tulsa called the Center of the Universe, and there is a black monolith um, sticking up into the sky. And most people don't know this about Tulsa, Oklahoma, but the architect that created the World Trade Centers also did a 55 story half, half height building identical to the two towers. <laughs> and finished it about a year later and in 1991 this monolith was put up with the black cloud at the top of it and when you stand in that place in the center of the universe you see that black cloud making the exact mark that you would see from the airplane strike supposed airplane strike on the world trade center and this has been there since 1991. 1991 it was built do you know when the World Trade Centers went down? <laughs> 10 years later. 10 years later. What else is on the side of that? The so, airplanes and things. So when you're looking at it from the center of the universe side, as you walk closer, you notice there's a bunch of guys all over it. And there's 60 hands on there, just hands. Kind of odd looking thing, just all stacked. And there's an arrow kind of pointing, going like this. So it's talking about raising up and building that building. And so there's 60 of these hands, and those 60 hands represent the 60 people that died creating that building. If you Google it, how many people died in the construction of the World, World Trade, Trade Center, Center in New York? Yeah, 60 people. So then we have on the opposite side, it's the oddest thing. You see four guys with their arms up, you know, like surrendering. And underneath it, there's four airplanes. So those are four pilots of four airplanes being hijacked and there's an arrow going down and from that side you see the cloud and you see the artificial cloud and you can't see the building because it's behind you now. So from this side, you, it's the perspective of the World Trade Center is gone. So you see the airplanes and they're there and they just keep going down the side and then all of a sudden they start to go into disarray like they're hijacked and then there's three airplanes and then there's two airplanes and then there's one airplane and then they're gone. So it's just foreshadowing the whole it's telling event. the story of the narrative of what they presented in 2001 to us all to go to war. Yep. And that's what it's doing. And, the, and it was already written at least 10 years in advance, 10 years in advance. Well, let's go back in time a little bit to 1983. Back to the future, the Twin Towers Mall became the Lone Pine Mall. 
what was the clock tower? What was start going down those rabbit holes and looking? All this was told to us years in advance, and then it happened. How'd they know? How'd they know how many people were going to die? Okay. All right. Let's get back to something else. You guys can read a lot of this because you've got it, right? How many people download this at lunchtime? <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm not going to read it all off. Pay close attention to the deaths, all right? I'm going to pull up something. I should have did this earlier. But we, I tend to get off on these tangents because I feel they're, they're very important. Okay, why is my finger not working? Well, of course, too many things name the same thing or close to it. Uh, maybe that's it. No. Nope. All right, heck with it. I never have patience. And you guys don't need it either. So we want, we want to get things done. People are too patient in America. Get Do like the Europeans do and just go outside and uh, start yelling, okay. top of your lungs. We have to rebut the presumption of death. We have to declare in full life. The main thing you have to do with that, though, is first you can only be recognized as one person. When they have the ability to recognize you as a hundred different people and put a hundred different names that are you, that you will admit or consent to because it sounds like you, you've got to get that all down to one person. That was the reason I did the deed of reconveyance years ago, to take all these names that you could think of and reconvene them to one and put it on the land and publish it and then they can't use those other things, All right? So with the name change, there's a reason it's important. Is it easy for everybody to obtain in every state? No, it's harder and harder and harder. So we've got to do multiple things. We've got to solve our court situation. We should start demanding from our legislators chancery courts, courts of equity, and demand from our legislators to speed up the process of reverting back to common law in our regular uh, inferior courts inferior courts. 
use those words because that's what they use. That's what our founding fathers used. So there's 94 courts authorized by Congress under Article 3, 13 appellate courts, 36 chancery courts, separate from that. Those are courts of law, courts where they can prosecute criminals. All other inferior courts do not have any authority over a criminal, period. They don't. They're administrative courts and are administrative admiralty jurisdiction until they become common law courts. When they become common law courts, they follow the Constitution. And they become those courts that the Founding Fathers say are extensions of the Article Three courts. So we have to know how our courts function, how they work. And they're not functioning that way in this nation for the most part. And they haven't been for a very, very long time. We've got a demand they go back to common law. We can use Gorsuch's notice put in all of our cases. And the more it gets put in, what happens? It's like 500,000 people standing up. That's what it's like, doing it with paper. And the court clerks are going to go, holy crap, here's another Gorsuch letter. And let me tell you, the head court clerk is the head banker in the bank called your court. It ain't the judges. The judges wield that power in the county and where the sheriff won't even go against the judge. He wields that power through the Mason Hall. Judges are almost always higher level Masons than the sheriff. So which oath was the sheriff following? The Mason oath. See, I recognized that right off when he was talking about it. And I wanted to let it sink in what he had said earlier today to you and then bring it up after lunch to see if you recognize that that was the reason. And you didn't. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. I knew it right away. It is a very, very interesting thing how it all works. And until we know how it works and we see how corrupt it is, we're absolutely slaves. See, slaves back in the day, and I'm just going to refer back to our early days of slavery, they worked the fields, they worked the fields for somebody they knew who was the master, who was really just the foreman, the slave master. But they knew they, there was somebody above him, the guy in the big white house with the pillars out front on the plantation. Well, not a funny statement. You ever seen a picture of the white house? Pillars out front, the big white house, right? On the plantation. That's exactly what it is. But who's the slave master, the foreman directing the slaves? It's the county courts. There's 3,144 plantations in this country. Three thousand one hundred forty four courts. The leaders of that plantation, they go hang out at the Mason Hall. How many Masons in this room? Check one. All right. I love it when they come. 
I hope they learn. You know how many Mason cards I've cut up for in front of groups? A lot. Are Masons all bad people? No, they're not. At the lower levels, they don't know that much. But even the very lowest level Mason oath starts to talk about how bad it is. And it gets worse. See, I had family that was very high level Masons. And I was able to read some of their books. And there's 900 Mason halls in Texas that are run by the Grand Lodges. And somebody runs the Grand Lodge. And over the last 35 years, helping with trafficking of people and children, I've run into this a lot. In fact, in the state of California, every sheriff's the coroner. He can shoot you, write the report, and bury the body, and write the medical report, and sign off the death certificate, and send it in. What's he need a judge for? Righteous men need to learn to be righteous again. We're all sinners, even the righteous ones. Sometimes the ones that try the hardest, the ones that believe they're righteous. It's an indoctrination program started at kindergarten. How many, how many people went to a child's play recently? Four score and seven years ago. That was one of the biggest indoctrination programs in the history of mankind. It started with your third and fourth graders. Okay. On and on and on. Every man and woman in this nation I love, and they all have the opportunity to repent. And I'll give them the opportunity to repent. And if any Masons want to come repent, they can. I'll pray with them. Especially if they want to cut up their bar cards, like we had done in Kentucky and Minnesota and a few other places last year. We are coming to a point in our history where we've got to speed things up. I've been saying that for years, but now it's even more critical. There's a lot more things important than even our AORs now. We still need to do them, don't get me wrong, but it is not the true focus. First, you better prepare your family to survive. You seen everything going on in Europe with the tractors and the truckers? You see all the truckers down at the border in Texas? For every truck driver that's down at the border in Texas right now, and that's miles and miles and miles and miles of trucks. For every one of them that's down there right now, there's a load of food not being delivered to a grocery store or to a hardware store or to a restaurant. Truck drivers are the lifeblood of this country. If they don't get their loads delivered, we go without. And when they all stop delivering loads to run down to the border, your shells are going to empty. And right now in Europe, shells are empty, aren't they, Hans? Pfft. 
What happens when your shelf empties? Let me tell you something. People become animals. I have seen it. I've seen it in other nations myself personally. And when they're hungry and they don't have any food, they become animals. And you start looking like 165 pounds of pure protein to them. Prepare for the worst. Hope for the best. Prepare. It all gets... Pray, it all gets solved, and none of this happens. But prepare. Do you have food storage? Do you have water storage? Do you have enough ammunition? <clears throat> Clear back last January, I drew circles on the board, and I've said this twice this weekend for a reason. They use Dallas-Fort Worth as an example, the Beltway, 10 million people. Well, you cut off all the gas trucks going to the gas stations inside that Beltway so people can't fill their cars. You cut off all the food supplies going to all the stores inside that Beltway. So 10 million people who consume don't have anything to consume. And they run out of food in seven days. People living in apartments, people living in small homes in town, they barely got any food for their family at any one time. And they don't have food storage. And when a father needs to feed his children, he's going to move out to the rural area and come find it and they're going to find food and people are going to find food fast and it's going to happen so much quicker than any of you can imagine because they've already tested that so the first thing they're going to have to do do you think very wealthy elite people live right in town. They usually live on a 40 acre estate somewhere, right? What are they going to have to do when they see 10 million people inside the Beltway, Dallas, Fort Worth, coming towards their home? <laughs> They're going to start killing those people. How are they going to kill them? What do they have to add to that mixture the military just sprayed with chaff that they dropped under the pretense of weather radar? They ain't going to have to add much to dispose of 10 million people. And you are the enemy. I read that to you already right out of their own right out of their own documents. And you think they won't do it? They've been doing it through Monsanto and Bayer and Pioneer and you know, farmers that are uh, there to make money, big corporate farms are there to make money with corn and soybean on farm subsidies. They've taught you how to destroy your own family without thinking you're doing anything wrong. Those farmers are the best people on the planet. They're they're the heart and soul of America, and we tell them that because they're growing our food. Are they really growing our food? Are they growing potatoes and carrots and broccoli and spinach? And No, they're growing corn and soybeans and GMO wheat. Under a contract. Under a contract. That's right. Why? 
because they've raised the price of a tractor from a few thousand dollars to a quarter of a million. <laughs> and they make you think you have to have a new one every couple of years so you can write it off on the taxes with all the money you're making. You're making less money now than if you were growing a freaking garden and selling it to the farmer's market. A lot of these farmers aren't making a whole lot. So then they talk you into crop insurance. I'm trying to make you understand one thing here. It's not even about the farmers. I'm telling these stories to make you realize we've all been freaking indoctrinated in one way or another, every dang one of us. We got to start looking inside ourselves and looking inside God's word and saying, how do we make it right? I've been sinning. And if you think it ain't a sin to grow soybeans, I beg to differ. And I'll show you where it is. And I love you anyway. They grind it up and they put it, feed it to the dairy cows and they, you can't buy mayonnaise in the grocery store hardly without having soy in it. Everything has soy in it. Soy is a major disaster for your digestional tract and for your health. Major disaster. Especially because of the poisons they put on it and they put on it in the soil and they killed all the earthworms. They poisoned all the water. A farmer told me the other day, man, I'm getting 30 bushels an acre out of my corn. I said, God damn you, you should be getting three. Because if you're getting 30, you've been poisoning your land, you've been poisoning your water, you've been poisoning your family, you've been selling out your soul for money. I might as well raise the prices to 20,000 a piece coming in the door because then I'd be doing the same thing. I keep it as low as I possibly can to pay for the room and the food and the things. But that's what the farmer just did. So he could buy the quarter of a million dollar new tractor that he needs to keep production up and all the fertilizer. How much fertilizer costs you guys? <laughs> A lot, see. What about the pesticides? What about the herbicides? We're killing ourselves. We're killing our children. We're killing our grandchildren. We're killing one third of the sea life will be gone. And how do I know that? Because the Bible tells me so. And I believe in God. <laughs> Everything the medical industry does under the auspice of health is not healthy. How do we change America, you guys? How do we change <laughs> Well, it's a necessary evil sometimes, but uh, that's true. We need to hold groups. We have to have meetings. We have to have small meetings. We have to have small local meetings. We have to make decisions to tell the government what to do with themselves. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Do it faster. 
I know, but we don't have any more time. Humanity's running out of time. I'm trying to tell you that. Read Isaiah 59. Read Exodus. Anytime in the Bible it says, for in that day, pay attention. Because they weren't talking about the day they wrote, they lived when they wrote it. When they say, for in that day, they're talking about today and what's coming. 66 books in the Bible. You got to be kidding me. You're telling me 2,000 years of history, 3,000 years of history. What if I told you from Adam to Christ was how, how long? 4,000 years. That's a 4,000 year period just to get to Christ. That's just the Old Testament. You think they wrote that in a few books? No, it's written in hundreds of books. There's more out there than just the Bible of God's Word. What's that? Well, that's where it used to be stored. <laughs> Listen, read more than just the Bible. It's time now. The Bible got us by for a couple thousand years. It's time now to read some more. Start reading the Dead Sea Scrolls. Start reading the Masonic. Maconite. One, just type in Bible written in 144 AD so I don't have to butcher the word. <laughs> My tongue just doesn't work right sometimes. It's the whole reason I wasn't a language expert. There's a reason. I barely speak English. What's that? The, yeah, yeah, there's many, many, many ways, but the, the 54 book Apocrypha, please read it. That was removed from the Bible by the Catholic Church to make it easier for the devil. If it makes it easier for the devil, and that's the reason it was removed from the Bible, what does that mean? That is damn important, and we better read it, right? Who was Enoch? It was Noah's grandfather. There's a reason Noah's family was saved. Enoch was so perfect of a man, he never had to experience physical death. He was taken up into heaven, and he was brought back. He wrote through three books. How many of them have you read? You've read two out of the three. Awesome. Still reading. Awesome. Thank you. Can you imagine hiding the writings of the most perfect man on earth? Besides Jesus Christ, or in the same company, I should say. Jesus Christ, you think he didn't have to die? He could have just went to heaven too. He was that perfect. But he died for us. He didn't die for him. He died for us. He experienced all that pain for us to save our souls. Enoch didn't have to do that. He just went right to heaven and came back. I love my people. I love this country. We got to save it. We got to save you. All of you. And I need help. I need all your help. 
I can't do this by myself. I'm wearing out. Okay, one of the ways we do this, unfortunately, in this life, things cost money. I hate money. I don't like to count it. I don't like to look at it. I really hate money. I've always been that way. I never worry about it. I just know if I go help somebody, God blesses me with money. Because he knows it's a necessary evil too. We can't even put gas in our car and go somewhere without it. There's nothing we can do without it. But are we the lovers of money? No. But the more money we have, the more people we can help, the more places we can go, the more we can get off the couch. When you have no money, what do you do? You sit at home and eat Cheetos. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> She's so funny. <laughs> See, we, we, people become homebodies staying on couch and watching the TV because it was a one-time investment of a couple of hundred dollars and a monthly investment of thirty, forty, fifty dollars for the cable, and that's cheap compared to a gas tank of fuel and a hotel room and going to see people that need your help and. If we had more money, we could help people with filing fees, mailing fees, document copy costs, printers, printering, computers that they might need. Heck, we could provide all the prisoners in, in prison with a law library that they don't have. Can you imagine 2,000 woman prison all behind one wall? 2,000 women in there and their law library 60 or so books? <laughs> the lawyer laughs. I'm teasing her. The lawyer laughs, 60 or so books, she laughs. Well, of course, because, geez, I remember back in 1989 when the entire IRS code was 72 books. And now it's like a hundred and some books. And that's just the IRS code. Huh? How many bookcases were we building for the office in Texas to hold all those law books that are in boxes all over the floor? I mean, Bonnie has a quarter of a million dollar law library. She's read them all. That's right, we almost didn't have room to meet because books stacked up everywhere. You know what? Her cell's that way. You know how many books she gets from Amazon? All right, you guys can go through most of this because you've got it. If you don't have it, you darn well better download it and get it. Print, print it yourself off a copy. It's worth the ink. It even tells you the evidence you need to present to prove you're not dead. I'm telling you, I, I, I think we got you everything we need to go get your hearing. You're going to have to study. You're going to have to learn. You're probably going to have to ask some questions. You don't even know what questions to ask at this point until you, you dive into this a little bit. Here's where it talks about employees being missing for 12 months or two years and what, what happens, okay? On and on and on and on. Here's your requirements for rebuttal of presumption. I mean, this comes out of their employee manuals, guys. 
If you can go into Social Security with your Social Security card, fill out a form, request a hearing, be, be confident enough with your rebuttal of the presumption of death, and if you've got the vital statistics record of that death, you know who signed off on your death. simple affidavit of you didn't know this person you don't know who he is and i'm sure he didn't try to get a hold of you can you prove it that's uh, evidence enough to rebut the presumption of death so you have to have that and the fact and the evidence enough to rebut it a, de a doctor's certificate would help uh, making friends i used to joke about make friends with your coroner Say, because if he has the authority to prove that you're dead, he also has the authority to prove you're alive. Any physician does. Okay? So get proof and evidence. You need three pieces of proof and evidence that you're alive. <laughs> Sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> The court order name change helps, see? Puts it in your proper name, a non-commercial name they can't use. So the presumption of death and then the declaration of in full life, quotation marks. That's what that term is called. It's not a declaration of I am alive or life or anything else. It's the term is that you got to use is in full life. And then you have a hearing to settle the estate, settle the matter. Best place to get the hearing is Baltimore, Maryland. So you might. And I'll tell you why the best why I suggest going there. You can you can call in advance, get your time set up and everything. But the reason I'm saying go there to do it is because I've, we've stopped at many, 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 many Social Security offices. And they don't know even what the hell we're talking about. There's no employees in there trained in depth enough. You, when you got to take their own manual in and you have to find a guy that works there 40 years and his career is about over, that's the only guy that might understand it, and you can have to show him some of it because he hasn't read the employee manual in a while. But understand, there's very few experts in any Social Security office in this country that knows what the hell we're talking about. So we sound like we're walking and speaking a foreign language, although I know we're both speaking English. They just don't get it. I know because we've gone through employee after employee after employee after telling them each three times and we, we had to go to multiple offices and just not give up. And then we had to read all this shit and I'm talking this a lot of paper that doesn't really apply to me to come up with a few pages that does apply to what we got to do. And once we do it, then I can throw that in the trash. <laughs> light it on fire you see what I mean it's a tremendous amount of work and effort to get to the point you need to get to make it simple so you could go do it oh yeah we're getting those all the time now you understand we figured it out and now DOT plates we can get the DOT number for to be exempt gosh that took us a while the amount of work, time, effort went into that. Now we got a whole group of people teaching that stuff. And it can be done. All these things we're talking about can be done. Over the years, sometimes we accomplish on how they can be done, they go change it. We used to have to start over. And we learn and we learn and we learn and we figure out how to do it, and then they change it again. But now, 
we're outsmarting them. We really are. Now we're getting to the point where they can't change it. The terminology is the point to settle the account or are we probating? Okay, let, let me, okay, let me go through this one more time because that's an important question. Remember when I had my big whiteboard and I write Wells Fargo on it and the birth certificate's the main checking account, right? Picture your own checking and savings accounts in your bank. Birth certificate's the main checking account. You go get a social security number, it's a savings account. So it's just one account you have in the bank. All of the accounts are held under your SESQV trust. So security is one account, but it's the one account you've been putting the most savings in. So it's one of the biggest parts of the trust. Okay. The birth certificate part of it's a hundred million minimum guarantee. If you were willing to drive to Baltimore, uh, you can have the hearing to schedule a hearing. Would you actually tell them what you're trying to accomplish? Would you kind of keep that on the way so they don't? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the state of Oregon with the state income tax. As much as I know in 35 years of doing this stuff, when I was fighting the state of Oregon for income tax, I could never win for a very long time. And the reason I could never win for a very long time is the state of Oregon became an expert at how they ran their business. They, you call them and you get a gal maybe named Patty and you ask Patty the, the questions. You ask Patty the questions that you need to ask. Well, maybe you didn't think of them all. So you said, I'll get back to you, Patty. And you hang up. The next time you call, you ain't getting Patty ever again in your life. That switchboard knows your number and it ain't ever giving you back to Patty. It's gonna give you to somebody else and you gotta start over from scratch. And you ask questions and you learn a little more and you will. It took me 20 years to learn that I had to specifically ask for a level three auditor. And I had to have a hearing with him. <laughs> years to learn that one little thing. Once I did, scheduled the hearing, I went in and I stood at a little podium like this in a courtroom setting with a level three auditor and two level one or two auditors who just sat there and watched and learned from the big guy. And I literally went into a court-like setting, walked up and in 56 minutes to present my case, I said, we have to let you know within 24 hours. They asked me if I was finished. I said, yes, I am. They said, go home, we'll let you know within 24 hours. In 23 hours and 50 minutes later, they called me. And they said, your case has been dismissed. Your account balance is zero. You'll get your letter in a week from the state. I said, no, I need my letter today. I'll be there in 20 minutes. And I drove across town and I got the letter because I was closing at a title company where I was about to get sued on some real estate that had a lien on it that I didn't know had a lien on it for years. And I never even knew. And I had to get that lien off of there or they were gonna sue me for non-performance. And that's how I beat the state of Oregon in taxes. Because guess what? You can't tax a debt. So, Social Security is one account. It's one of your largest accounts. What I'm teaching you here with this 
is a way to maybe get it a big portion of your trust and get that money in hand where you can do with it what you want, like maybe who said retire? Come here, bend over. I'm about to kick your ass. No, what I was going to say is where you can use it to do some good. Set your family up. There's enough there. Set your family up, fine. And then go use it to do some good. Go use it to save America and your neighbors. Go use it to tell the corporations where to go. We all should be writing writs of quo warranto and killing these corporations. You can dissolve their corporate charter with a writ of quo warranto if you've got good, sufficient reasons. Sign an NDA. No. We're, we're free to talk about it. Oh, that's another. Thank you for saying that because you just reminded me of something I really wanted to cover this weekend. But I'm going to show everybody this little picture. I don't know if they can zoom in on it with a camera or whatever, but it says haven't you ever wondered who the black hats were that q always spoke about is the kazarian jews okay they wanted to go to the president every year or every well oh, they're probably there for dinner most nights so on the Masonic handbook on page 183, Masons are required to tell lies and even perjure themselves to protect other Masons. They are also required to obey even orders which they know to be immoral. Back in Kentucky, I had a man sat through a three-day seminar. He comes up to us, asks Bonnie and I to pray for him. He was very worried about his life being taken because he was a very, very high-level Mason who at one time had ran one of the Grand Lodges. And he wanted out. In fact, he said he'd wanted out for 20-plus years and knew he couldn't get out for fear of death of him and his family. It's the high level Masons that's the problem. See, and that's what I've always said, even like the Catholic Church, it's not the Catholics that's the problem. It's the high level Catholics that's the problem. And it's the same way in any church. And even Satan's temple, Satan's church, has published that they've infiltrated all religions at the highest levels. I'm not picking on him. <laughs> I love that man right behind you. I understand that. I do. I'm not picking on him. I'm telling you what's run, been running the country and been running the country for many, many years. And it's coming to a halt. <laughs> yeah, you probably would. <laughs> no, you're not going to get that manual. You can get the Mason's Manual for Legislative Procedure and the Mason's Manual for Administrative Procedure and the Mason's Manual for Judicial Procedure, and you can see how our governments run because that's the oath they took, right? <laughs> well, are you going to answer? I love that, brother. Thank you. I know what I know. I know. I love you. I do. Have you ever 
ever taken any of these matters to an office of hearings and appeals through the administration? Have we taken them yet? Instead of Baltimore, because there's 10 regional offices of there is, there is 10 regional offices. I have not, and you're welcome to do that. Please tell us how it goes. Seriously. Seriously. There's no way one guy could find all this stuff out. I've only read a couple hundred thousand pages in the last five months. Give me a break. You cannot learn it all. We don't live long enough. There's too many law books. There's too much to learn. I've been doing this 35 years. I read a lot and I feel like an infant sometimes. I feel very inadequate sometimes. But we've got to solve the problems, <laughs> which means we've got to keep trying and fail and learn from every failure. All right? So I need help. So go out there and fail a few times and tell me what you learned. Help others. Get on the channels. Bobby's channels dropped by like 8,000 people. That's ridiculous, you guys. And I know he kicked a lot of people off, but whatever. Well, I'm sure so did I. It's okay. Look, this is what I'm talking about. They think they're not in the same foxhole with us. I say, I know he's never been to war. He's never stood next to guys firing guns in the same direction and having guns fired at them at the, from uh, the other direction. Because when you do, you don't bicker with your neighbor. You don't fight amongst each other. The dumbest thing we could ever do is fight and argue with each other. <laughs> Stupid. Well, of course. Hey, yeah, spent all day on Valentine's Day, him and Tia watching my seminars, coming to Texas. I let Tia have this for two days to download documents and stuff. Absolutely. There's nobody in the United States in this movement that I wasn't the inspiration for because I've been doing it longer than everybody else. And you know what? It doesn't even bother me they don't like me. It doesn't bother me a bit. You know how many people I've seen come and go? There's 330 million people in this country. You think a couple thousand of them bother me? <laughs> they still learn something. They still benefited. And they benefited greatly. And then one day they'll wake up and realize that. And I've seen some of those people come back around. And they've come back to be some of our greatest leaders. So I'm not worried about it. I know it's all temporary and sticks and stones and have never broke my bones. They just don't. They bounce off. I'm built a little differently than most. But people say for a, a guy my size, you got fairly small hands. And then I make a fist and they see how freaking hard they are. It's freaking steel. They don't understand how I'm built. And that's just an example. They don't. And I don't care. I've been through things they've never even thought of or seen. I've had to survive things that they haven't seen. And when you've been there, you think I'm not worried about the rest of you? 
because I know of a very well-trained group of people, I was the only one that got out. And the rest perished. Someday I'll tell you those stories. Most of this material you're going to find is all about death. How sad. <laughs> 22 CFR 72.6, report of presumptive death. It has to be a local finding. When there's a local finding of presumptive death, remember it all comes from the county to the state to DHHS in Atlanta. Please remember that. We have to know where it comes from. We have to know how they get paid. The amount of U.S. code just in Title V that's referenced on all this is amazing how much material, how much law, truth you find in what I'm giving you here. I ain't giving you anything that I made up the slides on. Everything here came off of their websites, right down to their forms. Okay? Some of those forms had to be screenshotted in multiple parts. <laughs> But they're there, and you guys got it all. And I didn't do just the Social Security Administration. That's not what all this is about. This is ultimately about you gaining full access to your trust. But it's about much more than that. And I'm going to try and... It's so hard to present, you guys for me to you. It's very difficult. First, it's the first time I've presented it right here. Bear with me. Second of all, the material is very in-depth and it's multi-agency. And it does a lot of different things. It'll get you ultimately to your entire trust. It'll get you to some money from your trust in one account right away. It will show you how they're treating you as chattel property, how you're all civilly dead. And I know some of you know that, but the difference is when you see it and see each agency saying the same thing, it really starts to add up. And it's all the proof and facts so that when you go to your neighbor who knows nothing, because you learn a whole bunch and your language starts changing, you start throwing the words out of how do you feel today, Mr. Dead Man? <laughs> Are you civilly mortus? <laughs> you can start having really fun with this. <laughs> right? And you start getting it from U.S. Department of Health and Human Services with the big old CDC logo on the corner, right out of their manual. Oh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Teaches you even how to fill them out. And I love their new examples in their newest edition. They used to go with things like heart attacks and strokes and cancer and things like that. And now they go to things like acute renal failure, comas, mellitus. They go to things like all the things that the jab is causing, the myocarditis. Those are the things they're using as examples for the employees on how to fill out the forms. They're admitting everything that they've freaking done to us if you just look at how their examples they use on how to fill out the forms. I even give, we even give you stuff out of the medical examiner's and coroner's handbook because we read them all. 
What? <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry was a big help in this, along with Miranda and, and and myself reading it. I I was gathering information from their re good researchers, right? So they helped me. They helped me research, get on the computer. They're better at the computer than I am by a hundred million miles. Okay, and they can type fast. I I'm a one finger picker. Well, two. Okay, these guys can type. They can look things up. They're smart individuals, and I give them all my love and support and credit. Thank you. You know, one thing I've always loved about this movement, and our it's so much different now than it used to be. And I've watched the, I watched it evolve. God, we got guys like Adam and Bo and the. Hey, I bought and retraining that for righteousness that's going to eliminate the evil in AI. I know it will. You know how I, 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 I said it before, but I don't know if I got through to a lot of you. I know that I have the power to cast out demons in the name of God and bind them and give them to them and say, here, you take them, do something with them. I know the little old me has the power to cast out things I can't even see. Well, they can design this whole huge system of AI evil, and one little bit of it can cast all that out. Because AI is just like us. It's a human brain. It's a brain. Doesn't that give you hope? It can be used for terrible evil, and we can fix it. Just like if you watch all the Terminators, it got fixed. Right? Exactly. See, they, that, those were due process movies. All movies are due process movies. Have you seen these little pop-ups that come up all the time and it's advertisement for some game and how most of the games are zombie games? You think they aren't preparing you? It's already started in America. CDC has been training it. Why don't you look at this one? What's it say across the top? Stakeholders claim in our death registration. Look at <laughs> with Bonnie in prison, I researched the Texas prison system. When someone dies in prison like her father, his says to QV trust was claimed by the state of Texas. Now, do they get to keep it all? They are right now. But if Bonnie stands up and makes the claim, and she's got 99 years to do it, they got to repair the whole damn thing. Everything they've taken. But every prisoner that dies in prison, they keep the SESTA QV trust. What's that? What is her status? Yes. Well, listen, the condition of the mother, whether free or slave, is the condition of the child. Okay. You under, have to understand genealogy, hierarchy, heirship, trust, as it's come down through generations. It's always been passed father to son, father to son, father to son, oldest son, right? Do you, all those siblings get cut out? No, they don't. It's just the son, oldest son, becomes a trustee who's responsible for the other siblings, and so on and so forth. Doesn't matter if they're women or men. And this is why women inherited a dowry. The one she was, got married, it went to the 
husband, right? Does that answer your question? Okay. Exactly. Here's your claim. Did they tell you full and honest disclosure of the contract when you went and got a marriage license? No. Did you believe that it was between you and your wife and God? There's your answer. It's equity. She was your property. A wife is the property of her husband. In all trust law and all hierarchy forever. Yes, you do. And her parents and grandparents, first to claim. First to claim. What's that? Well, that's a due process. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, it does. You have to be righteous with that. Yeah. Even if you don't like your siblings. Okay, here's what they're going to do. Now, I'm not talking about the Social Security claim. That's your savings account, okay? But when the full estate is claimed and you're claiming it on the benefits of others, you have to have a plan. You have to have a trust. You have to show who the beneficiaries are, and that's all your siblings. That's all their children. And you got to show how that trust is going to benefit all. And you just become, as first to claim, the trustee, the new trustee. It ain't just for you. It's for the benefit of humanity, which means the benefit of your family forever. Okay? It does. Okay. I wanted to get into this a little more, what you just brought up this weekend, about fetal death. Oh, my gosh. Vital statistics means records of births, deaths, fetal deaths, adoptions, marriages, dissolutions, annulments, and any data relating thereto. <laughs> How did you know the you know, I was two pages away? <laughs> I'm sorry, that happens a lot. Hospitals and Physicians Handbook on Birth Registration and Fetal Death Reporting. See, we read that too. This handbook is prepared for the National Center for Health Statistics, U.S. Public Health Service, Department of Health and Human Services. That's a long title for the same place. Okay. And it contains instructions for physicians, hospital personnel, and others with responsibility for completing and filing records of birth and fetal death. It pertains to the 1989 revisions of the U.S. Standard Certificate of Live Birth and U.S. Standard Report of Fetal Death and the 1977 revision of the Model State Vital Statistics Act and Regulations. So, you know, we read all that, too. All of it. If I found it in this, I looked it up and read it. I'll tell you, it's a lot. This handbook is intended to serve as a model for adaptation by any vital statistics registration area. Other handbooks available as references, and we read all of these. 
is the Medical Examiner's and Coroner's Handbook on Death Registration for Fetal Death Reporting, the Physician's Handbook on Medical Certification of Death, the Funeral Director's Handbook on Death Registration and Fetal Death Reporting, the Guidelines for Reporting Occupation and Industry on Death Certificates, the Handbook on Reporting of Induced Terminal termination of pregnancy, the handbook on marriage registration, handbook on divorce registration, any little thing that came out of a female's body in any way, shape, or form has a birth certificate and was given a name. And I am pissed about it. Miscarriages, the placenta, an abortion, anything. Anything that came out of a woman that is considered, you got to read the what's considered a human blood blood tissue anything basically that comes out of a woman is considered registered and is registered thank you Abortions are free accounts for them. It's all about fetal death, I'm telling you. The, what I've learned from all this in the last few months, I knew this thing was big. I knew it was huge. I knew it was bigger than I even would think it would be. And then I found it to be bigger than that. By far. And I'm pissed about it. So they created a TV account. That's right. Yep. Thank you. If you can, if you can find it if you can prove it if you if you know i think a lot of this is just never going to be able to be proven did he have a midwife okay he reported it He's a mandated reporter. I guarantee when he went back to his office, he filled out the forms. Or if you have ever filled out a form when you went to the doctor's staff, you filled it out, a miscarriage, that would be history. Right. Yes. Yes. Let me let me explain something to you. Since two thousand and nine, everyone is a mandatory reporter. Thank you, Obamacare. You have to pass it to read what's in it. Everybody became a mandatory reporter, even midwives. Everyone, police officers, teachers, school principals, everybody in the life of you and your child, anything one you consider a professional in any way, shape, or form is a mandatory reporter. I always knew that if you told a psychologist anything, you're screwed for the rest of your life. They, they write one sentence about you and you're screwed the rest of your life. 
because they're mandatory reporters, and since 2009, they confirmed it for me. In full life is continuing in both physical and civil existence. That means you're no longer civilly dead. You're no longer civilitus mortus. You're continuing in both physical and civil existence that is neither actually dead nor civilitor mortus. That is a statement of in full life. Therefore, you're going to need a declaration of in full life. So we wrote one for you. It was designed for a slideshow, but you can make it your own. This is. Okay. Now, part of that is party to a contract with the state under 26 CFR 31.3402 P1. <laughs> you know, you've got it in your paperwork. Page 59. He's following along with me with his paperwork. That is so awesome. Withholding. The term withholding means the deduction and withholding of tax at the applicable rate from the payment. Chapter 4, IRC, Section 1.14716 defines classes of beneficial owners that are exempt from withholding under 1.14721. I want you to look up those codes so you know what a beneficial owner is. And you're going to start to learn by reading a lot of stuff what in full life is. Ah, remember all those old terms like secure party creditor? Do you know why secure? Because I've never taught secure party creditor. No, 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 no. Well, let, let me get to the real reason I've never taught it. The real reason I've never taught it is because those people are not in full life. And if they're not in full life, they can't be a, a creditor. See, this is why status is so damn important. It's more important and more in depth than most people think. By far, they don't think deep enough to figure it out. Therefore, they go to jail all the time. Okay, this is why the FBI calls them a uh, sovereign citizen. <laughs> A term I absolutely hate because of its oxymoron, but I understand it. And I keep saying that over and over again. And you guys are starting to learn why I understand it. It's for reasons just like this. And they mentioned secure party creditor in their FBI manual for training law enforcement. I don't teach stuff that's in that manual. The reason I don't teach it is because they haven't achieved it yet. Nobody can, has achieved it, and not enough. There are a few. But when those few pop up, you don't have to tell them anymore. You don't have to teach it. Because by the time they got to that point, they already know. But if you can go to the Social Security Administration in a hearing and rebut the presumption of death and declare you're in full life, and you get access to that part of your state, how much easier do you think it's going to be to get access to the rest? So how do you eat an elephant? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and I can show you their bank statements. <laughs> a life estate is an ownership interest in a real property. 
I'm going to repeat that. A life estate is an ownership interest in a real property. The right of ownership exists for the lifetime of an individual or individuals. Upon the death of an individual, the ownership passes to the remainder man. Remainder man, that's one word. And it's written in all lower case, and it's got parentheses around it. Anything that's written in all lower case and with parentheses around it, pay close attention to it and put that in your new vocabulary book. <laughs> okay. The owners of a life estate is called a life tenant or tenant for life. An individual who merely has the right to use property, an adult child promises a parent the right to live in a home for the rest of the parent's life, does not have an ownership interest in the property. One distinguishing factor is that a life estate may be sold or otherwise transferred. Permissive use, however, would not be a legally transferable right. The parent may not sell the parent's permissive right to live in the home to a third party. An individual may receive a life estate interest through a deed or a grant, through an oral agreement or state law. In most instances, however, the individual cannot pass the life estate interest onto the individual's heirs. Now you at this point in time, after me reading that, are probably going, why the hell did David just read that here? Because it came out of the Social Security Palms Manual, the Program Operations Manual for the Social Security Agency. <clears throat> and it talks about individual heirs. It teaches you about trusts. And the whole thing's a trust. Everything's a trust. We have to understand how trusts work and how deeds and grants work and why in order to be the king, the king has to own his castle. If you don't own a castle, you can't claim it. And I learned that a long time ago. And I realized that, hey, there's a lot of my brothers and sisters in this country who don't own their own home, who live in an apartment, who live in a condo, who live with their mom and dad. Are they any less my brothers and sisters? Are they still sons and daughters of God? Are they still potential kings of the king of kings? Yeah, they are. So how do we help them afford to buy land? Does it say how much land? Does it say you got to own 50 acres? Does it say you got to own 20 or one? Does it say you got to own a square yard or a square foot? It doesn't matter how much. You just got to own it. Once you own it and you've got a deed, go claim your estate. There's nothing that says it. You got to own it. You got to claim that it's yours. Prima facie evidence of your claim is that little deed. You have to have evidence of the deed. That's why that little piece of land in Texas is important. And I don't care that it's in Texas. I just Texas makes it easier for us to do than other states. <laughs> I don't care if it's in Belgium. You got to own a little piece of your land. See, when God led Moses to lead the slaves out of Egypt, he prepared in the desert for 40 years. He had to figure this crap out. I feel like a Moses. 35 years of figuring this crap out. And then God says, go grab the slaves. Lead them out of Egypt. And then he gets to the river. <coughs> and 
<clears throat> it's part of a sea, right? And it's deep, and it's got to be parted. And they let, it was led to a beach where the water level wasn't as deep as the rest of it. And he asked God for help. The Romans are after him. And the waters were parted. And he says, go inherit the land over there. Those are very key words. Go inherit that land. What happened when they did? They no longer were slaves. Do you understand how everything that I teach you comes from God, from the Bible? Everything. I tell you, go buy some land in Texas, nine square feet if that's all you can afford. I don't care if you go down and buy 40 acres from somebody else. I really don't care. But a lot of people can't afford 40 acres or even one. But by God, they could come up with enough, maybe, to buy nine square feet. And that's how this went through my brain. See, it's the way I think. I think in a lot of depth and a lot of detail that most people don't think. Well, right in the Social Security Manual, on their website under secure.ssa.gov, Apps 10, Palms Manual, it says, conveyance through a deed or grant. Part of conveying your full life is to have a deed. And there are people in this movement that say that's not necessary. I just call them shallow thinkers. You know what makes you a deep thinker? Years. Years of study. We're all shallow thinkers. Human nature is shallow thinking. I mean, we don't even know all the reasons why we're mad at somebody, and we go be mad at them. And if we knew all the reasons, we wouldn't be mad at them anymore. We don't know how that stuff works. We haven't thought deep enough because we haven't known that person for years. You see what I'm saying? Here's a whole page off their website of types of countable resources. Do you understand this is your prima facie evidence that will help you? Most people look at that and read the whole thing, and what's that mean? I read it and I go, okay. It says right here we got to have a life estate. We have to have the remainder interest in the life estate. We have to have a checking and savings account set up because if they give us a big old fat check, where are we going to put it? It's just a stinking piece of paper without a place to put it. And it tells you all the resources you need. They don't explain it all very well, but it's right there. It tells you. See, this is why I said, bear with me, that this is going to be a different sort of seminar, because I got to teach you a lot of things like depth of thinking and how to read something. And that pipe's leaking. Yeah, it's raining outside. So the air conditioner just kicked on or the heater just kicked on and the pipe's condensating.
Okay. Most of you aren't going to get this one right off the bat. I get it. It's 31 CFR section 901.3, page 63. Okay. When the name and TIN of a debtor match the name and TIN of a payee and all other requirements for offset have been met, the payment will be offset to satisfy the debt. Federal dispersing officials will notify the debtor payee in writing that the offset has occurred to satisfy in part or in full a past due legally enforceable delinquent debt. And here's why this is important and why it was put in here, because it was referenced. These codes that are in here aren't stuck in here randomly. They're referenced by other manual stuff. So I look them up and I print them off for you and I put them in here for a reason. <clears throat> so don't think anything in here is not necessary. Everything in here was carefully picked through. Okay. And there's more to be added in the future. But it's telling me right here, I've got to have a TIN. What's that? You know why? No, do you know why? Seriously. Because right now you've got a social security number, right? You're going to get rid of that. When they collapse that, Social Security number is gone. The only way you can operate in the world with banking. So you're replacing your Social Security number with a. And then you're making that number exempt from taxes. Isn't that beautiful? And you can also get credit on that. And that credit account will be attached to your deposit account. And then when it comes time for the bill to be paid, it's actually gone, not for a later date. Okay. Yeah, the government told you right there, not very easy to understand words, but if you know a lot about this stuff and you know how to read it and decipher the code, it's all right there. There's things in here that we talk about like mergers because I don't want you, again, I don't want you to think it's unimportant. When you get this, every page in this is important. I'm going to say that over and over again. There's a reason, okay? So, trusts are everything, right? Well, so are other things and merging things together in doing this process requires some things you got to do. So I'm going to read something and I'm going to read number three on page 64. In criminal law, merger of offenses is the absorption of a lesser included offense into a more serious offense if a defendant is charged with both. It's a merger. In civil procedure, the doctrine of a merger is a principle that a final judgment for the plaintiff brings together all parties' claims involved in a suit. As a result, the plaintiff can only enforce the judgment awarded and cannot bring any of the claims again regardless of whether the award seems too small or the plaintiff has a new legal theory. Likewise, the defendant cannot bring any new counterclaims or defenses. The effect of a final judgment is called a merger. The purpose of a merger in criminal cases is efficiency and, the, and to avoid the void or the avoidance of double jeopardy. See the merger doctrine, and it's underlined. That means it's a link. 
You can go to their, this website, pull this up, hit the link, learn more. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Chances are you got the old one for a purpose or a reason that's not going to apply. So. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go to, that's why I just said, you're going to have to go to the website, look it up. All right. And then pull it up. Now on the PDF, there isn't a link. Remember, this was designed as a PowerPoint presentation. So. I had to figure out an easier way to do it. And rather than thousands of dollars of paper copies for you guys, and we had to figure out a, a, yeah, a different way to do it. Okay. This is really good on seal. 42 U.S. Code Section 3505 under seal, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services is authorized to adopt an official seal to be used as directed by the said Secretary on appropriate occasions in connections with the functions of the Department or any office, bureau, board, or establishment which is or shall hereafter become part of the Department, and such seal shall be judicially noticed. That's the key word there shall be judicially noticed. Copies of any books, records, papers, or other documents in the Department of Health and Human Services shall be admitted in evidence equally with the originals thereof when authenticated under the seal. Now, you want to make sure when you get your certified confidential birth and death vital statistics record, that so you go through the same process as you did with your birth certificate and with authentication. The birth certificate itself is merely prima facie evidence that the trust exists. The citations are in the very, very bottom of the authentication. And for those that didn't have it, we put it in here somewhere. Pretty sure we did. Somewhere. Maybe not. I know I saw it this morning. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not the writing at the top. Everything down in the lower left-hand corner of you, the authenticated birth certificate is all the citations you need to look up on your authentication to show that that's a $100 million bond. Thank you. I knew, I knew I found it. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially all of it right there. So page 72, we've gone and actually printed it all out for you. All the citations that are on the lower left hand corner of your authenticated birth certificate are all right there. And if you go to that website, you can click on the links of everything that's underlined and learn more. That's the kind of crap that makes my blood boil too. When you go to cdc.gov and you're reading all these manuals, the 
Center for Disease Control Prevention's National Health Center for Health Statistics has the authority to administer the vital statistics function at the national level. What did that line just tell me? They told me that the CDC is over the DHHS. Because the DHHS is the Department of Health and Human Services, which keeps hold of all of our birth and death and vital statistics records, which are all of our marriages, annulments, divorces, births, deaths, even the fetal death records, everything is under DHHS, and CDC was given the authority to have all of it and oversee all of it and manage all of it. If you follow this whole one chain of crap of subsidiary corporations, it leads right up to the point where it says the stakeholders of I, my blood's just boiling right now. I can feel the heat. It is the stakeholders of. So then you check into who the stakeholders of and who are those corporations and who owns those corporations. And we did all of that. And I'm mad. Uh, for 30 years, I've been fighting against the one world government. And it's here. It's here. Here it is. Now, the nice thing is, I learned very easily, much easier than I thought before, of how to slew it. How to kill it. How do we kill it? How do you kill a multi-trillion dollar corporation. You take its beneficiaries and you pay them out and they have no assets left. Oh, shall I say that again? You take its beneficiaries and you pay them out until they have no assets left. Isn't that beautiful? That's our stones. I've been telling God to please tell me to go grab five stones so I can slew Goliath. Well, yeah, let's talk about that for just a second. She, I love you, Denise. She asked a great question. She said, if everybody in this room did it, how much of a dent would it make? So I'm going to, I've thought this out in depth and in detail. I'm going to tell you how big a dent it'd make. Uh, hold on. In every bank in the world, and I can show you the account numbers, I have the numbers of the accounts. There is an account with a whole lot of money in it that not even the CEO of that bank can go attack. He can't get it without the guy who holds the badge of the authorization of the 13 families of King Solomon, because that account is God's money. And the banks can't get it, the cabal can't get it, and they're pissed off. They have been for hundreds of years that they can't get it, and it's not theirs. And they've tried to steal it by trying to steal the hard assets from time to time. But guess what's nice about those hard assets? God made them so they never can disappear. 
You can't get rid of gold. You move it from one spot to another spot, and somebody steals and puts it over here. It can be easily found, traced. You turn it over, it's got the account number of one of those accounts, and it's also got the king's seal on the bottom. So it's evidence of a theft, right? So one army can take out another army, get all the houses and bring them back, which is exactly what happened with all those bars underneath the Vatican for miles and miles and miles. And that's just one of the places. It never disappears. They can't get rid of God's money. <laughs> and it's held in trust. And it's managed by trustees. And those trustees are the 13 families all over the world who can't even use it for themselves. Because it ain't theirs. The trustee can't take money out of the trust account. It's for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Who are the beneficiaries? Next generation, next generation, next generation. And every one of you are sons and daughters of Adam. Every one of you. So it's for the benefit of the people of the world, the Filipinos alike. The first people, all of them. Well, they own 40% of the assets. It's the biggest of the 13 families. They were the first people, the closest to. I can see that right off the bat. So what I'm trying to tell you, through the Maharakan tribe, you can trace your lineage back to Adam faster than the rest of us. And he was 19 feet tall. Filipinos are short. <laughs> Cute little short people. I love them. We've sure shrunk over time. So, <clears throat> how much of a dent would it make? She's trying to get me back on track here. Okay, there has never been in the history of the world enough trees on this planet to cut enough to form the paper, to print enough money to cover all the assets. And there's no way to use all the assets. One or two of the three or four largest accounts would cover the seven billion people for the rest of their lives, for all eternity. There is so much I can't even tell you. God left us so rich. He left us so rich. When he says mansions in heaven, he ain't kidding. Make Bill Gates' mansion look like a pauper. There's that much money. I'm trying to tell you it's so much. So the den it would make in a room, let's see. If I whipped out a picture on my phone, which I can do, and I can show you a posit on an 86-year-old just average woman that's worth a hundred billion. And you're a hundred billion, 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 and I go through the room until I get to the last person way in the back, and all of you are worth a hundred billion dollars. <sighs> How big a stack of paper would that be? Well, I know, because just a few hundreds, you know, get that big or so. See? So how big a dinner would it make? Huge. They can't print enough money. And they never will. That's why most of it will be kept digitally. Okay? Isn't that beautiful? Does that give you a picture in your head? See, the, here's the problem. In the banking industry, have you been told that the amount of banks have to keep on hand is like 3 or 4% of their depositors for insurance purposes? Shh, don't tell anybody. 
So we'll say it's 10%. No. Just say it's 10%. And that's all the money they got on hand. If we went down and took all the money out of the Social Security portion, it'd be such a big bunch of money that they'd be bankrupt. They're out of business. You know what happens when they go out of business? The trustee steps in. Government controls, but trustee is the ultimate control. The trustee steps in, say the manager of a trust fund I've mentioned a couple times this weekend. And he steps in and he's got the authorization of the 13 families to release the money in those accounts. <laughs> Your smile got bigger. It won't take you that many of us. It might take a few more than is in this room, but it is a percentage of the population. We've always been told it takes 3% to fight a war. When it comes to this war, financial war, they don't have 3% in savings. They don't have 3% of the money printed. When one account is 478 followed by 152 zeros, the United States government hasn't printed that much paper money since we've existed. Do you see what I'm trying to say? <laughs> So a lot of it's in digital accounts called financial service centers who are there to allow us to just buy what we need and give away what we need and fund projects we need. What if you wanted for your family a thousand acres and go build 10 homes on it and give it to all your kids and your grandkids? Maybe 10 homes ain't enough. I know it's not my family. <laughs> I need 50 homes. But what if you wanted to do that? And that was your project. And you got the money, just go to the bank. That's what it's going to be like. There will be no rich because there will be no poor. There will be no rich because there will be no poor. As quick as you can help make it happen. Get off your ass. Let's go. All of us. All of us. Let's go make it happen. See that? He just confirmed it. They only have one and a half trillion printed in treasury notes right now. Like it's one point five three six trillion. Yep. What's that? They want the other two to be honest and then it's about ten thousand every second. That's right. <laughs> For every dollar in deposit money that's released, they have to burn a deposit money. Do you understand what I just said? These are Federal Reserve notes. This is fiat bull crap. If I had $50 of our U.S. Treasury notes that are backed by the assets held in trust, which is the gold and silver, and I had one of these that was a 50, this one would have to be burnt. It goes away. So as these notes get released, which they are being released, it's going to take a long time to print them. We've been printing them since 2019. I watched the first container load being shipped. So if we, it's in most of the banks already. Wells, Wells Fargo banks have it in their vault, in their branches right now. That's right. They just got to switch it. You know, it's two keystrokes. 
That's it. They switch from positive to negative and they add a double dollar sign, double line dollar sign. That's all they have to do, two keystrokes. And it switches and you'll no longer be making deposits, you'll make deposits and your D is when it's removed from your account and paid out. And your creditors are then paid. See, not just discharged, paid. Okay. So is there a revaluation? No, whoa, 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 slow down. <laughs> <laughs> They've already started releasing some in certain locations. They started this week. Exactly right. Uh, the form 56 remember yesterday has become more important than ever not less when certain people in this movement says hey stop doing that you got to be kidding me i have learned how much more important than i had ever thought it was full faith and credit so we won't have to worry about it is it's quantum page 74 absence for seven years presumption of death person presumed found living this comes right out of the public law Even the U.S. Code is just prima facie evidence of the public law, okay? Rebuttal of presumption of death. There's the law for you. Okay? We ain't making this shit up. That's page 75. The evidence you need to fix it it's right there i'm giving you all the power in the world really as i've been going through this last five months i'm i'm an emotional wreck to the point ulcers are bleeding inside and i'm pissed and i just want to strangle people like gates and soros and the stakeholders of the who you know, and at the same time, I'm smiling because I'm saying, we found it. It's like finding a sunken ship full of gold. It's so beautiful. We found it. We found the keys that are missing. Okay. I love Jerry. You don't know how much I appreciate you. I don't tell you enough. I would just love all over you, but that would be kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> that man is so smart. Go back to page 74 and look at the date on that. Might have something to do with John. December 23rd, 1963. I like this one on page 76, because if you look at the top, it came out of the, the Mason's Legislative Manual.
and as the powers of courts over legislative bodies generally. The people of each state are vested with sovereign authority. Right there. It ain't the state that's sovereign. It's the people that are sovereign who vest the state with authority expressed by their elected representatives serving in the legislature. That's exactly what I just said. The people are sovereign who express the state with authority. We give that authority. We can take it away. We can give it. We can take it away. We can give it back. We can do things with it at any given moment. And I'll tell you what, for those driving around and these policy enforcers out there, maybe you ought to show that right out of the Mason's Manual for Legislative Procedures. The people of each state are vested with sovereign authority expressed by their Who gave it to us? Thank you expressed by their elected representatives serving the legislature. Thus, legislative power is absolute and unlimited except as restrained by Constitution. This one little page is so important. <laughs> I get excited. And the stuff I showed you yesterday about the Chancery Court, I just whipped this off of Tennessee's Chancery Court site to give you an example. We need to either find a Chancery Court in our state, develop Chancery Courts in our state, make sure our legislators are putting Chancery Courts in our state, and we got to get them back. A state is not a state without a king. And a king ain't a king without a king's court. The Bible will tell you over and over and over and over again about your only remedy. What is that? Equity. Equity. <laughs> Your only remedy is equity. You can't have equity unless you can get in an equity court of law, and you can't have an equity court of law unless you have chancery. Because it's the king's court that gives you the equity. God gave it to you, but that's where you enforce it with the people. So there's an assignment for those that choose to accept it. It's like Mission Impossible, right? You know, I've operated for 30 years with that statement. I sure like you. <laughs> Silly hat and all. <clears throat> so there's a, a little bit larger print so you can see it of some things and various fees I knew there wouldn't be enough time in two days to go through all this and still get I see the hardest part for me as a teacher up here is to convey the message across I can give you all the freaking paper we want that, that's not the issue. To let you know how important it is to drive that home, to get you into action mode, to help you understand how critical it is to all of us. That's the hardest job of all. And it's the one place I hope God gives me enough of a gift that I can give it to you. I pray for that, that I can get my point across. 
and my feelings and my heart and my soul across to you so you know how important this is because this is more important than any preacher's message this is why i don't mind doing these on saturday this is my sabbath day i want to keep it holy but this is how i keep it holy because you are my congregation i love my people of america and i want to reach them all and i want to reach the whole world I'm so proud of you, Hans. You have no idea how proud I am. And that man's flown halfway around the world and he does it on his own dime and he takes his own time and he travels around this country talking to the people he finds is the best and the brightest hopefully that'll help him and he gains knowledge and he soaks it up and he puts it to work and he revs up the people and he makes a difference and there's nothing more important than that and there's nothing more important than what he told me last night at dinner, and that's leaving that legacy to his kids. He does. He could quit at any time and go do something else. He's got the money to do what he needs to do. He does it because he doesn't want his kids to think his dad didn't do nothing. The law of consecration, and that man just went to heaven. Pure. Really, stand up. See, he didn't know at that one little dinner that I listened. I listened to every word, and those words have meaning in that one little sentence. I dwelled on it all night while I was in having a fever and in sweats, and sweating all night long from fever. Something happens to me when I lay down, and the infection hits me, and I'm burning up, and it's not good. I went to bed last night shaking like I had Parkinson's, and all I could think about was those words that Hans said. And how he forever burnt a hole in my heart. I love you. And even if we never see each other again, I carry that with me of how you stood up for Belgium. See that? He's more of a hero, hero than anybody that won a freaking medal in the military. To me. Okay, now page 82 is the blue It is worker and life record of living trust. Understand well who's your beneficiary. There you go. Your infants. Your children. <laughs> and an infant must have a T I N. T I N, not an E I N. 
T-I-N. And once you have a T-I-N, you might be able to use it to come out of infancy. And something interesting it says, for an entity of an estate, the requirement is the SSN or the ITIN of the decedent. When you open a bank account, those are decedent accounts. Any decedent account is a deposit. You have to be in full life. So what happens if you're not a decedent and you're in full life? Now it's a posit. Hmm. We all have to think in that negative positive. That depth of thinking is incredible. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you a key. I'm going to I'm going to spoil it for all those bankers out there. And here's my leather whip that I went home and fashioned <laughs> for the bankers. It is called in every bank, the treasury manager. That's a job title. The treasury manager is the manager in the bank who knows the treasury and knows what it's about. And he knows everything about these estates. He knows about positive and negative. And if you want to set up your account and you want to do some things, you might want to talk to that man and find out who he is. And there might not have one, and I know they don't have one in every branch, and they don't have one in every small town. There might be one that oversees 100 branches. But that's the man you're going to need to talk to to set up the account under your TIN that you can transfer a very large check from the United States Treasury that you got it when you got through your hearing at the Social Security Administration to get that portion of your account. <laughs> mm. Time ago, you indicated some couple of people that allowed you to go to your bank. Twelve USC four eleven. Yeah. I I broke my bank with that name. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's not surprising. That this is the page I was actually looking for. It's page eighty five. This this is just blown up picture of the of the bottom left hand corner of your authentication on your birth certificate that's why it's this color and this writing because it came off who's got an authenticated copy thank you okay right here in this bottom corner is this okay these are all the citations you want to look up which proves to you that this is the full faith and credit with a hundred million dollar guarantee it does it says full faith and credit right on there but these are the citations so we put it in here for you okay now you were having a little issue about canon law and not being able to find these okay uh, Miranda's not here. She's probably out with her daughter. She hasn't seen her daughter in a while. Oh, yes, she is in the back. What, what are you doing hiding back there? <laughs> you changed your boots. All right. Okay. So anyway, 
Miranda could tell you the other day that she 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 pulled these pages out of this and she says here Jerry had a little bit of a problem with this look it up I'll tell you what how long did it take me to find it maybe a minute a full minute and I found it so I put it back in um, th this canon law is all right about the Sesta QV trust it even talks about Westminster under Queen Anne, proof of life in the Sesta QV Trust. See, in, in 1707, this is uh, article number III, in 1707, Westminster under Queen Anne, uh, in the, found in 6 and C18, that's her laws, the Queen's Law, extended the provision of the proof of life and Sesta QV extending the use of such structures ultimately yeah, all these people out there that says oh there's no sesame trials god i can show them books full of court cases i can show them all kinds of canon law i yeah i can i can find it anywhere it's all over the place oh yeah right right so here it, here it is right here for all those who have naysayers out there say ha 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 <laughs> never thought david straight would be doing that did you okay it's all here all of it is here and it even tells you where to go to look it up now these are laws of england mostly but england is what now the United States. How cool. We swapped it on her. Who did that? In 2000 and when? Aha! Uh -huh. Trump? He swapped it on her. It's not Vatican. Who? Okay, that's third. The crown. The crown is what? The corporation of the monarchies of Great Britain. All of them. <laughs> Used to cover France, England, Scotland, Ireland, you know, all these little Wales, all these other little areas, right? That was under the Crown Inc. And the Crown Inc. was like the all-powerful corporation that the Vatican allowed to exist. And underneath that was the city of London, an independent city state like the Vatican of Rome, like, right? Okay, and what was Washington, D.C.? Another city nation state. How many others are there around the world? Oh, wait, 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 keep going. There's Canberra. There's uh, one in Asia which was destroyed here recently. Um, there's New York City. City, nation, states. Be careful of those. How many are there? They're being consolidated. <laughs> Things are getting exciting, I'm telling you. So anyway, all these pages from 86 down through 95, he's so fast, he jumps way ahead of me, are all canon law. Now, what is the importance of canon law? <clears throat> Do you know? This whole world has been run by the Romans for a very, 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 very long time. I used to love a website that was the Vatican, the Pope, telling leaders of other nations what to do by papal decree and they'd write papal decrees and they'd put it on the website and 
presidents and kings would follow it. It's basically canon law. Judges follow it. Our Mason's manuals are written from it. It's long established law over a long time. Okay, and page 97. Corpus Juris Secundum again, and seven American jurisprudence are both on here. So the reason I stuck this page in, and I debated about it for a little while, we put this page in the day before yesterday. I had Miranda at it. And she did a good, such a good job of, she took a bunch of little slides and put them together to try and reduce the number. And she just, she's pretty awesome when she's not being sassy. <laughs> but other than that, I love her. She's, she's actually my cousin. And it's funny how that happened. And it's also funny the one I start, we started off doing her genealogy and now she's up to like more than 7,000 people in a very short period of time. And half of them are my relatives. So it's funny. So Corpus Juris Secundum, the death of the person on whose estate administration is sought is a jurisdictional requisite. Do you know how important that one sentence is? I'm going to read it one more time. The death of the person on whose estate administration is sought is a jurisdictional requisite. All of these inferior courts have no jurisdiction if you have no death. Because what they're doing is administering through magistrates your estate. There you go. So if we're alive, there's nothing to administer. It's null and void. There's no administration. Court closed. So the only thing they can do to you at that point is be a pirate and illegally hold your body. They can always kill us. They got guns. Right or wrong, no matter whether we win our case or not, we can win every single case out there that's not in an Article Three Court of Common Law or Chancery. If it's in an administrative court, we can win every single case because there's the tap root. Your life. Are you in full life? That's all you got to prove. And you want to prove it? A hearing at the Social Security office, rebutting the presumption of death, declaration of in full life, and getting paid out on that portion of your estate, canceling that all out, and they got nothing to argue with because they're just a bank. And they are the bankers. And they got nothing to argue. It's done, it's over, it's finished right then and there. <laughs> While the presumption of death rising from absence may present a prima facie case sufficient to warrant a grant of administration. You guys heard that, right? In ASN terms, real English, war rant. Okay, in a grant of administration, if it subsequently develops as such persons is in fact alive, the administration is void. 
It is absolutely essential to jurisdiction of the administration of a state that the person on whose estate such administration is granted is dead. A living person has not a state subject to probate. This is why we used to have to go into federal court through a probate federal judge in an Article Three court and prove we had dominion, that we were alive, and we had to prove it and show that we understood it and show that under, we understood how the trust worked and show that we understand it and we're competent. This is what we had to do to gain access to our state in the public. I just made things a lot simpler for you. Go to the Social Security Administration and remove your savings account by proof, rebuttal of death, and proof you're in full life. Get prepared to do that. Don't just willy-nilly think you're ready and go in and do it and screw it up for the rest of us. I'm giving you all, lots of information here, and it's information that needs to be learned. But my opinion is, within a few months of some diligent work and effort, I just made you a millionaire. <laughs> Doing it, on the other hand, is up to you. And I have been chomping at the bit to share with a lot of my friends in the movement and stuff like that, and I got a few of them here. But I've been waiting for this moment, at this time, in this place, to really lay it out for you and give it to you. Seven American Jurisprudence 2D. In some jurisdictions, the Attorney General is designated by statute as the public officer charged with the duty of bringing actions for escheat or for a sale or conveyance as a cheated property where state and county interests as to a cheat of the state of an intestate are at odds, the attorney general has a valid public interest in representing the state upon a determination that there are errors to it. That, now this is where it gets very positive for all of us upon a determination that there are heirs to a cheated property the state no longer has any right or interest in the property <laughs> and the attorney general may not even contest it the distribution of the estate on the ground that other heirs may exist who have a better claim first to claim can't even be contested. Saved it for last. You understand how important this 97 pages are, don't you? I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot to absorb. I know you're going to have to read it with the eyes of a learned state national. It's the language, it's the it's the stuff that we figured out in the past that sets the foundation to be able to understand this. I could go give this to 100 people out on the street and say, hey, read this and tell me if you understand it. And they're going to go, no. Nope. Probably all of them. Unless there's a state national walking down the sidewalk. Because you guys have at least watched a whole bunch of base seminars. You've got the foundation of dominion. You know how important God is and the Bible is, and you've got the basic foundation of righteousness, and you've got the basis foundation of taking dominion over yourself, your land, your soul. You guys know a little bit about land patterns, a little bit about trust. You know a little bit about a whole everything you need for me to give you this. And now you can go do something with it.
Okay. How much time we have left? No, don't say all night. It's 5.08 now? Tomorrow. You know, I wish I could have done a three-day seminar, but I have places I got to be. And uh, I thought I could do this in two days. I knew it was going to be a lot. I knew it was going to be difficult. I knew it was going to be very difficult for me in the way I feel right now. I'm in great physical shape and absolutely lousy physical shape all at the same time. No, I feel like I'm healthy and my body's strong, but I got this infection. And my body's rejecting titanium from past injuries. It was a little harder on my body in my younger years than I should have been. And I got some parts and pieces that have been rebuilt. And, then, and I guess God doesn't want me to go to heaven with those pieces in there. So he's pissing them off, and that's hurt my body, and that's making me very tired at night and uh, making it hard on me. But I'm going to get rid of them and uh, see where we go from there. Yeah, hold on just a minute, and I'm I'm being. Uh... Go ahead, Katie. She's she's like across yeah, the back. Are y'all enjoying David Strait this weekend? Yeah. We're so happy that you've all come here and. Um, we know that a lot of you would like more of David, and so we want to uh, offer you to attend his mastermind. It is available uh, Monday, I mean, I'm sorry, every Tuesday. We get an hour with David where he teaches us step by step uh, more advanced steps that he has learned. I'm out of breath. <laughs> Bear with me. So if you'd like to, um, or if you're interested in checking out the mastermind, we left uh, this card at your table and you can just scan it on the QR code and it will take you right to the website. And right now we're offering the price at a lower uh, amount than what it will be at full price in a couple of weeks. So if you still want to get in at the price that we have it right now, uh, it will be at that price only for a few more days. I think in February 14th, the price will be raised. What is the mastermind? Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember. I don't have the price off the top of my head. If Adam would like to, Adam or Bo would like to come up and talk about that. Yeah, there's a reason why it's so much. It's costing us a half, about a half a million or so. Is that what we mentioned? He he, he would know better than me. So okay. go ahead, Adam. Uh, I'm Adam. This is Bo. Hello. It's a, a pleasure to meet you. Can, can you hear me okay? Okay. So we saw a lot of things going on and stay at my mouth. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And we created Freeman Bot. And one of the problems is that we wanted to solve was when we leave events like this, sometimes we get this paperwork and it's great. But when we get home, it's two days of intensive material and we get home and we have questions and then we can't reach David and we want to pick up the phone and call David, but we can't because David can't serve so many people himself personally. So Freeman bot was created where we put the information from David's brain into an artificial one, the Bible, the constitution, uh, a bunch of documents where you can resource those documents and have a conversation with it and it will respond to your questions and respond to your conversation which is great but sometimes we need to be taught new things as well and we need to be taught in depth and even ask questions of david so david so 
amazingly agreed to give up one hour of his time, sometimes more, quite, quite often more, every Tuesday so that we have a question session. So if you are going through the process with the Social Security Administration or anything that you've learned at this event, you can get more clarification to make sure you know what you're doing, that you know the next steps and get those questions answered because we need you, okay? <laughs> And when we get back to price and we circle back around on that, there's a lot more things we're like, we, we want to do to serve everyone and to grow this whole thing because we want every single American to be free. Every single one, all your friends, your family, your neighbors, your churches, everybody we want to be free. So in order to do that, thank you, we have to create more. So those things that we have to create. And not just Americans. Yes. Belgium's a United State. United State National. So we want more of those. Yes. Well, not quite like that. I got you. <laughs> so there is a price for everything where we put that into development. So we're, we're coming out with a Freeman bot 2.0 where David's translation tools are going to be in there, where we're going to be actually having documents customized where you can just kind of make it an easier step process, your information goes in, uh, the information comes out, we plan to have automatic services and just streamline everything to make it easier for you all to get your documents done, to get your freedom moving and to just have a happier, better, easier existence being free without so much hassle. So we're trying to take the hassle out of it for you. And that's why there's a cost, and that's why we've done what we're doing. Right. And we, we, we have a lot of fun on Tuesday. We really do. And it's a, it's a great time uh, Tuesday night to get together. I look forward to it every Tuesday. It's just a lot of fun. But I know a lot of you guys are really smart. You people, you know, a lot of you guys from Oklahoma and, and surrounding. This, I, I consider you guys the buckle of the belt, the Bible belt. You guys are tough. You guys are awesome. Um, but with this, you guys may be able to handle a fire hydrant of information. I can't, I need a little trickle every now and again. And that's what these Tuesdays are for. These Tuesdays are that little trickle that we can get and we can just a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time to help us grow together because it, this is an organic movement. This isn't something that is just set in stone because David just told you, this stuff is constantly changing. And as it changes, we're gonna get this new information and that's what these Tuesdays are for this consistent new information that we don't always have to wait for the next conference or the next, uh, you know, whatever, whatever show conference, whatever it is that comes up. So this is just that opportunity for us to do that and to be there with one another. One more thing, by the way, uh, Katie is going, we, Katie, we love you. Thank you for everything you've done. Uh, we're going to be having an affiliate program. So if money is a problem for you, it's yours is free get three, which means go out to your churches, go out to your civil organizations, go out and get other people involved, stand in front of Walmart and tell people to join, to get their paperwork done, and then yours is free, okay? So there's no excuse of it's too much money or I can't do it or whatever it is. We have affiliate programs set up and we're trying to help you guys out as much as possible and we need your help to grow this. So we need you to take it to your churches. We need you to take it to your, your organizations. We need to have you guys go back to your communities and tell as many people about this as possible to get this moving even further. So. You uh, tell us what the difference is between the price now and the price later. Yeah, it's, it's all on the website. So wh what we're trying to do is keep it under a cup of coffee a day. So if you can sacrifice one Starbucks every day and substitute Starbucks for educating yourself and helping your family and your friends and your whole community and the whole United States and then the whole world to get some freedom, then that's all we're asking. Can I, can I answer that real quick? So I've been to several events and I love David. He teaches awesome stuff, but a lot of it has been some repeat because he just, he just said he just doesn't have a lot of time. And I have spent well over $10,000 going to David's events and doing things online. And this is an opportunity to, to, to share that, that learning and also on the savings of 
experiencing all those events and bringing it into your house where your comfort. I was just right over, right over here and there was a homeschool family. The daughter was doing homeschool just yesterday, bringing somebody in here. That's awesome. There's uh, people bringing their kids in here because it's not easy to always get to these events. And this is a way that we can help bring these events to you at a length of time, more than just a weekend or two weekends or, you know, a, a couple of times a year. You could do this once a week. What's the difference between Freeman bot and masterminds? Well, the Freeman bot is actually our uh, artificial intelligence brain that David was telling you about. And sometimes, especially here in Oklahoma, it, it takes some distance to get to the local library or to a place. Well, we've developed this in order to bring that information to you in a conversation you would have with this uh, uh, online intelligence. Uh, that's the difference. The mastermind is this intelligence. This is David's intelligence. That's the mastermind. He's live every Tuesday. You want to add to that? No, that's a great question, though. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, with the mastermind, you get both. Yep. So mastermind yep. Freeman bot is free with the mastermind. Yeah, it's free. And this is a this is a year program. So uh, it, it's all included. There's extra coursework in there. You get all the documents. You know, we're we're just trying to give you as much as you possibly can and make it as easy as possible for you guys uh, to do that. And we charge because we have to develop future things. If we don't charge, we can't market and get more people. If we don't market, we can't develop new things. And we're developing a lot here. So and any new ideas, any new documents, any new anything that you guys have. So maybe in your research, you find something, send it to info at freemanbot.com. And, you know, <laughs> we're, we're always looking for more. So the replays of the masterminds are there for the entire year. So, yeah, you're going to, well, for your entire year and then ne the next year and the next year. And, you know, this is it's, it's a long process. And, and we you got to stay in it and not quit and sometimes it's going to be hard and you're going to face roadblocks but if we all stand together and we join up and have a mastermind that's the purpose of a mastermind you guys call look up the definition of what it is and it's where you come together to help each other and that's that's our purpose and also we did we did a prayer event for all of you that missed it we did a prayer event for bonnie uh and we 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 talked about the habeas corpus and things like that so if you guys want to want to watch that come come email us at info right info, info at freemanbot.com email us and we'll send you that link you guys can rewatch that and then have an opportunity to send a rid of habeas corpus on bonnie's behalf yeah, yeah. and uh, to answer your question again yes all the replays are there if you missed anything yes we will send all that to you oh yeah absolutely there's yep. always time absolutely it's never yep. too late. thank you thank you that was a very good question there's still more time to do more writ of habeas corpus yeah thank you Yes, sir. Yeah, don't worry too much about that. Because here's what happens. Here's what the rules are at the Supreme Court. It gets there <clears throat> and it gets read. And everything that any lower uh, I don't want to, uh, how do I say this? Any, uh, aid reads, gets a summary report. So what the summary report will say is Bonnie's name, or what state she's in, what, what prison. It'll, it'll have a little summary. So if enough of us send it in, hers, which is filed, you see what I'm saying? They're going to say, all right, 20,000 people just responded on this woman's habeas corpus. Who the hell is she? Maybe we better take a look, do something, because otherwise the odds of them doing anything are nothing. We need you guys, right? So. It's a very small thing you can do that with. Right. I, I appreciate that. Uh, again, straightevents.com is where you download the pages, go to seminar products, click on Claremore 2024 updates, under pro, uh, add it to cart, under the promo code put D-L-S-M-O-R-E, Claremore, D-L-S more, and that, huh? 
<laughs> yeah, okay, after you enter the promo code, you hit apply and it will zero your cart and then complete payment. And then you'll get the access to the downloads in your email with the receipts. What, what they're asking is, does it have to be uppercase or lowercase? I just do all caps because I'm, I'm not sure. Just all caps, no space. Oh, it's all lower. I think either way works. Yeah, I don't think it matters. If one way doesn't work, try another. Just make sure there's no spaces before, between, or after. <laughs> so uh, while I'm up here, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Katie. Um, on Telegram, I'm Butterfly Mama. I have AOR help if you need help with your paperwork to declare your status as an American state national and to get your passport. I can help you with that at AORHelp.com. I can also help you with your trademarks if you want to trademark your name. If you need help with your um, business, moving it out of the public into the private, I can help with that as well, and trusts. So if you need help putting your assets in a common law trust, I am working with um, an expert who's been doing that for 30 years, so I, I can assist you with that. So please visit AORHelp.com if you need assistance with um, any of that. So thank you very much, and we look forward to our next event soon. Bye. Nope. Can you hear me now? Okay, now you can hear me. Okay, a lot of people have come up and have been asking for my contact information for all kinds of different things. Let me just give it to you right now. I'm going to give you my email address, my full name. The only reason I'm not going to give you my phone number is with way too many people here. So if you have something that you would like to talk with me about. There's more online. Please. They're going to be watching it forever. Oh. You have no idea what you're doing because I made that mistake once. And here I am. <laughs> it turns into thousands and thousands of people. Tens of thousands of emails. Well, then maybe we need to turn I'm, that off I'm for a minute. To scare her a little bit. No, we... it's all right. Okay. <laughs> okay. See, I'm telling you, handle that on your own. Con I'm just saying. Give you know, your email, and that's it. That's that's it. That's okay. all I'm going to give. Say it quick. Okay. Rule Law Partners at Gmail dot com. My last name is Rule R U L E law law partners at gmail.com okay It is actually on Freeman Bot. It went up on there uh, Tuesday. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know if we put that on the straight events page yet. Okay. The Gorsuch letter. Huh? No. She's talking to somebody else. Okay. I thought somebody said something to me. I can put it on Telegram. I'll put it we'll put it on the Telegram channel. That's that's easy. All right, guys. Z D Z A Y D E E Z D Rule. What's her name? Well, there's 300 people in this room. Okay, now I had somebody purchase.
one of these books, did our law enforcement officer in the room get one? Did he? Is he here? Or did he have to leave early? He used to be. Did you get one? Good. Who did not get one of these that couldn't afford it, who needs it real bad? All right. She actually held her hand up the longest. That's what I was waiting to see. So you guys that give up early, stop it. I'm trying to teach you. You stick it out, you keep trying, and don't ever quit. Don't give up the first time. This is why we fail all the time. This is why people say, oh, that American state national stuff doesn't work. It ain't because it doesn't work. The law is all on our side. It's because you quit. You give up. You go to an agency, a government, you talk to a young woman behind the glass, and you ask her a question. And she answers it the way she was trained to answer it. And it's not the answer you were seeking. And then you walk out the door. No, ask her again. And then ask her again. And tell her to go get somebody above her and ask her again. And ask that one again and again and again. And ask them to go get somebody. Work your way all the Do you know that I had a phone call? with the Postmaster General of the United States? I don't freaking give up till I'm at the top. And you know what he said? He said those little change of address forms that you fill out with the name change stuff, yeah, that just goes to some low-level... Uh, data entry person who changes your address in the system. He goes, you want to fix that problem, send it to my office. I said, okay then, sir, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So I learned something. How to notify the United States Post Office that you're in full life. <clears throat> and you don't go to some little low-level data entry clerk with some form that you fill out. Oh, thank you so much. I was about ready to let you all go without that crap. Voting records. Well, go ahead and finish your question. That shows that you're proof of dead. If you can vote, you're dead. None of us are supposed to be voters in this country. We're supposed to be electors. If you've got a voter's registration card, send it back. Don't. What are you voting for? Thank you, sir. You took the words right out of my mouth. What are you voting for? Are you voting for the president of the White House Office, Inc.? See, President Trump's already the president of the United States of America, and he's the commander-in-chief of the military, and he flies around on Trump Force One with a C-135 hauling his motorcade with lots of Secret Service and Marine One, too. So, who are you voting for, and what are you voting for? You still have control over your school board. Show up at the meeting and don't shut up. You don't even have to vote for those people, and you don't care who they are. Do you understand all you got to do is keep the most evil person in line? Who cares who gets in the school board? I know that, but who gets into the school board? Doesn't matter. 
they still work for you. All you got to do is show up at the school board meeting and not let them hold business if they're not going to do the right thing, and then run their, give them the opportunity to do the right thing, give them the opportunity to repent, and then run their ass out of the office. Chase them out if you have to. In Iceland, they just picked them up, threw them, put them over their shoulder, to walk them outside, and tossed them in the trash. Told them not to come back. Now you're an American. Because Iceland is a united. God created this whole world. He didn't create part of it. Sure. I'm a smart party president. My understanding is that I control all my little Stevie guys. Really? That's what my understanding is. Even though I don't vote, I can direct. The capital letter wants to vote. Go ahead and criticize me. Here, let me do that for you. I will. He says he's a secured party creditor. And his understanding is, as a secured party creditor, he can direct his all capital little guys to vote for him. <clears throat> David Lester Strait, all caps. It's trademarked. It's a name. It's a name of a business entity. It might, could be Seven Brew Coffee or Starbucks. Doesn't matter. It's the same thing. One and the same. Walmart. Doesn't matter. It's the same thing. David Lester straight, upper and lower case. Now, not only trademark, but hyphen trust. Okay? That's a birth certificate trust. David Lester straight, upper and lower case, with the word by colon in front of it, is beneficiary, agent, acting as agent for the all caps name. I just did the same thing without the financial problems because I filed a form 56 on it telling them who the damn fiduciary is. You see? So you never have to do the secured party creditor stuff. And I'll tell you why. Because it's an abomination. And to explain that to you is going to be hard because it's trying to take financial control through a debtor relationship, not a creditor relationship. How do I know that? Because evil held a mirror up to righteousness and it's all about positive and negative. Did you file a UCC one? You went in debt. Rest my case. You put somebody under lien. That's the difference. That's why I don't teach it. There's many ways to skin a cat. There's easier ways, and there's more accurate ways with less liability. So. I think I was going to ask about the uh, voter registration thing. But we have an election coming up, and these polls keep doing things. They keep on voting for people before they ever show up. Right? And if you're not a citizen and you suddenly voted, aren't you welcome? leaving yourself open to a trap. Let me tell you something. 
We're never, as, as Americans, we were never supposed to vote for senators to start with. We were supposed to vote for Congress, and then the two best congressmen in the state for the state legislator became the senators and were representatives of the state to the federal government. With our federal government, we were only supposed to vote for congressmen and never senators, yet there's a whole bunch of senators that are elected. And the minute they became elected, they were subject to fraud. And I'm saying this politely. K Street dollars. That's what we call them in Washington, D.C. K Street dollars. K Street dollars are lobbying dollars. K Street is filled with lawyers called lobbyists who a lot of them eventually get very rich and run to be a senator or a congressman, and some of them presidents. And it's the worst thing that ever happened in this country. But does that, any of that really matter? This country's always been a what? Corporation. How many presidents did we have before George Washington? We had 14 presidents. Why is George Washington the first? Because he's the first in the corporation. You guys, the first registered corporation was done by Lincoln before 1871. D.C. was formed as a corporation in 1871. The United States was formed under a corporation of the Articles of Confederation, which is short for Articles of Corporation. That's been ratified, right? Yet they threw it away. That's the true 13th Amendment. That's right. That's right. That's right. And there's case law to prove it. No lawyer should hold office, but they can hold office in a, but they can't hold office in a government, a republic government. Oh, well, that makes things kind of simple right there, doesn't it? Hang them. They committed capital felony treason against the people. I didn't make that up. I didn't say that. I'm just repeating it. It's just, I'm just repeating it. I ain't telling you to go hang them. They said go hang them. It's codified in the United States Code to go hang them. It says where any two or more of us stand together and witness a, an overt act to the Constitution, that the person who committed that overt act has committed capital felony treason and should be arrested, hauled to the nearest intersection, and hung by the neck until dead at high noon. And that's in our codes. I ain't making that up. I'm not saying that. David Strait didn't say that. David Strait just regurgitated it. And they ought to be scared of that. They ought to be scared that we'd do that. And then they'd do their job right, and they wouldn't violate our rights. But they ain't any more scared of that than driving home. <laughs> There's a uh, handful of judicial notices up here you can take and make copies of, but the digital will be better because I'd like you to print them out by the hundreds. Sign your name to the bottom. Get two witnesses or go get it notarized with a notary sheet and go submit it in every court case on the planet. Everyone that you have, that you're a party to, or ever have had, I don't care if it's closed, go submit it. If the court clerk will take it and put it on the docket, so much the better. If he doesn't put it on the docket, that's okay too, because he has to read it. I want everybody in the courthouse to read one, 
If you got to hand them out like candy on the way through security, that's okay too, because those idiots in the blue uniforms ought to read them all also. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if they're a public servant acting and pretending to be government, working for a private for-profit corporation under the color of law, then they ought to get one of these documents. And I'm going to make sure you have one because you've got a big congregation. See? When I can show this to a lawyer and she gets so excited and then the next day she gets more excited and the next day she gets more excited and pretty soon she can't even contain herself as she gets down here from Montana to the class so she can talk to me about this afterwards and how we can use this document to save America. That's how excited she is. Understand this is the single most important paper I have read in a long, long, long time. Does that get the importance of it across? It's the single most important paper, Zadie. I don't like, huh, is it? That you've read in a long, long time? By far, she says, by far. That's in the download. I don't know. Get a hold of us. We'll get it available. We'll put it on the Telegram channel. Look for it. It'll be there. Do searches for it. The what? Five. Five what? Oh well, those we're going to have on Freeman Bot. Okay, and I think while we've been here today, Amanda has put those on drive and given them to Adam to get on there. So within a few days, they'll be on there. Hans, what do you need, brother? The Second Declaration of Independence? Yeah, I've read that at a bunch of seminars. Why? Why too? Well, because it needed clarified and redone again and the and the parties that were party to the first one has passed away so yeah so because of that i think a new one is needed because i'll tell you something there were some very bad language choices in the first one like the word we We, the people, is actually a problem, the way it was written. The people is more correct. So anyway, thank you for coming, coming from so far and wide. We got people here from coast to coast, from Spokane and Alaska, Arizona, Kennewick, Thailand. What's that? Yeah, just do a little shout out. Yeah. And you all guys came to Oklahoma. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm teasing the Oklahomans. No, I've spent a lot of time in this state recently, so. The Deceased Mother's Trust. Okay, first of all, there's two different trusts usually, one that she left and one that she has she didn't know about. That's the one, that's SESQV. All right, clarify this one more time. I say this all the time in level one classes, but 
You can go back 99 years. Every one of your relatives, first to claim, of course, you can go back 99 years. That means if you had a grandfather who was alive in 1933 and had a social security number and a birth certificate, he had a trust. If he was alive in 1933, he has a trust. Yeah. It didn't matter. I know people born in the 1800s that were alive in 33 that have a trust. Okay. So this has been going on a long time. England started in 1666. But you can only go back 99 years. See, our country started in 1933. It hasn't quite been 99 years yet. Okay. Well, I'm no circle back girl, but. <laughs> that was just a ploy to Zuckerberg's sister. You think I'm kidding? Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. Say that one more time. No, 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 no. It's, that's the notification to the post office. See, there are certain agencies of government that are important and a whole bunch that ain't. And my uh, thinking really soon of what's coming is a lot of the ones that ain't important ain't going to be there. We're, well, government's going to get whittled down dramatically. Yes. Okay. The post office ain't going away. <laughs> That's another story all in itself. Right now, they're kind of one and the same, same building, same employee, two different corporations. One's a registered corporation and one's a de jure. So you got de jure and de facto when you walk through a post office. The type of mail you use, the system you use, is what determines whether you're using the de jure or the de facto. That makes sense? Okay. So... When you do a name change, there's others out there teaching that, that you fill out the, well, what is it, the 3575 form? Well, I had to pull that out, I think. And uh, it hurt a little bit. <laughs> and uh, do, a, do an address change for that name change and uh, get that change. Re in reality, that won't do it. It doesn't accomplish what we need to do. What does it is an affidavit with a copy of the name change sent to the Postmaster General's office, just like we send stuff to the Secretary of State to blink it himself, right? You send it to him and it'll get handled. And if he has to hire more staff and put in shipping containers out back and, you know, guard them because it's registered mail, that will be awesome. Okay. Yes. <laughs> No. No, it will not. I am too. I'm very glad of that. What she said was when the SAR comes into full effect, we'll neglect all the paperwork that we're doing right now. 
No, it'll make things better for a lot of people. It'll wipe out a lot of debt. Basically, it goes under the old principles of the Bible where debt's forgiven over such and such a period of time and, you know, those kind of things. Um, it puts us back on the right track, but it's not going to touch your trust. Your trust is in trust. It's in trust. I mean, it's it's different. Specific instructions on how to fill out the form 56. Will we get or have access to specific instructions on how to fill out the TIN or anything else like that? You're getting ahead of me. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, in fact, I've, the more you're going to learn about the form 56 and the form 56F. F is in your packet that you're getting with this. That form 56F is uh, is a pretty neat form. So a month away, a year away? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, I'm saying go start learning something about it. Yeah. It is... Uh, I'm never going to be able to teach you everything. You got to take it upon yourself to learn a lot. I can make you aware of it, but you got to learn it. Now, Form 56 can be used for so many things to solve so many problems. I had no idea. And a judge told me that. Go ahead, Sherry. St. Germain Trust and the other trust you mentioned, are they one and the same, different name, different thing? <laughs> You've been listening to Kim Guggen again? No. Okay. There's a whole bunch of names for all of these spiritual accounts that are in all the banks, okay? They all have different names. St. Germain, Germain Trust is just one of the names on one of those accounts. Okay, they're all, you don't even worry about that kind of stuff. Really don't. Don't want to consume your brain and take up space because there's, it doesn't really matter in the end. The end is there's a bunch of trustees who have been managing all the gold and silver of the world for all the 13 royal families, which is all your money. It's everybody's money. It's God's money. And nobody's going to get a gold brick. It's not the way that crap works. How it works is that sits in storage. They know the approximate value. The value is determined by the trade. The trade is essentially the bonds. The bonds are going to be honest bonds, not... not uh, in other words, right now, your bonds essentially with DHHS is in fiat currency, but pretty soon they're going to have two lines on the dollar digitally, like I said, it's keystrokes, and it becomes non-fiat money, posit money. So the change happens, you ain't even going to hardly see it. You'll just be made aware of it. Maybe you get a terms and conditions statement in the mail. I mean, it's going to be painless, effortless. So those kind of things are going to happen. And... Uh, it's going to be a good thing. Hold on. Now. Repeat the questions, uh, Dave. Yeah, I know. That's really hard because they don't quit. See, there's these are women up front. I'm going to a man now. Hold on. Short and quick with an easy answer. That's I like. I like guys, man. <laughs> Beneficiaries, or is it all standard private? Beneficiary identification numbers? Okay, hold on just a minute. All right, first of all. No, 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 no. You are thinking statutory. 
statutory uses BOI numbers. Nobody gives a shit about those numbers <laughs> when you get into the real world. The real world of a trust is God driven, it's spiritual, it's the jurisdiction in the air. You're doing trust down here in the water. Okay. Second question. Are you uh, one of the, the one types we've heard about that's very limited and Who's next? <laughs> Question. Under the new system that you're teaching for how to go get your trust, will there be an NDA under this mechanism? No, because you're, what you're getting with this is one account, which is going to help you with everything else. I'm talking about the everything else. Yes, I think there will be. I, th I think there will be. See, once everything changes, this is where Nassar and Jassar, you guys, this is where Nassar and Jassar changes. And if you need to leave, that's okay. Okay. Once all that happens, not it doesn't change what we're doing. What it does, it will make it easier because you won't have to have an NDA because everybody will know. But until they disclose, you're going to be under an NDA not to disclose it to others. See? You see the difference? Okay. Once it's open, it's like going from a, uh, a confidential piece of paper. You know, this is between you and me. It's confidential. Now the whole world knows, well, it's not confidential anymore. Okay? All right. Okay. A year and a day is different than what they've been saying. It does not mean a year and a day to claim your trust. You got 99 years. The year and a day is you have to notice every agency that you've done contracts with within a year and a day. Does that make more sense? Exactly right. And that time passes so fast. Go online, but use that commercial address. There's nothing you can do about it. If a company comes to you and they want to do business with you, they're a corporation, right? So you want to buy something on Amazon, you have to be a corporation because of like kinds. Okay, a man can't deal with a corporation. A corporation can't deal with a man. We deal with grandma and our kids and grandkids. Yeah, you see what I mean? Those are the living, our friends, our family. Okay, everything else is corporate. We got to understand the jurisdictions, keep them separate, and be smart enough to be able to walk amongst the jurisdictions and operate in business and into the private. You can't jump out of business into the private. You'll starve to death unless your kids are going to feed you. Do you understand that, right? That's why it's important to know your jurisdictions and know land, air, and water and know what's commerce and what's business and what's private what's public and what's private you'll never be able to operate in the private and as far as your trust and everything else goes you're not in the private until you are remember the question she asked me about the nda She asked me a question about, do you have to sign an NDA? When you get full access to your trust, you sign an NDA. Now, here's the thing. All this crap about, oh, you can't talk about it. You can't do this. You can't. Bullshit. You know why? Because all these pages right here, are public information. They're all publicly published. I know because I downloaded their books and read them. 
If I couldn't download their books to read them, then they would have been private. But if their employee manual's on the website, I can download and read it. It's public information. Everything I teach is public information. Every law book is public information. Every law, every case, everything, unless they sealed the case, that's when they took it private. So we're always in the public right up until the time we're not. And that's when we sign that NDA. Because who are we dealing with? Corporations. Ah, uh, so all that bullshit that others are projecting of public versus private stuff, it's true to a point. There is public, there is private, but you are always in a commercial capacity until right up until the moment you're not. So can we talk about it? Did David Strait say anything today? No, I regurgitated shit. I gave one opinion. In two days. This is all public information. It's all codes, rules, statutes, ordinances, policy manuals right off their websites. There ain't anything about this that's private. So can I talk about it? Freedom of speech all day long. If I wanted to, stop it. Hey, Dave, before we dismiss tonight, this is Neil back here. Wait a minute. Yes, sir. Before you even say anything. Yes. I'm going to apologize to both Rob and Neil. Because Rob and Neil are so darn important. <laughs> oh, no apologies necessary, Dave. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> wow. Well, bless you for that. Thank you, sir. AMG, you guys. We wouldn't have sound and video if it wasn't for Rob and Neil. Well, God bless you. Thank you, Dave. Well, listen, we, we've had, um, we've had three... Three short questions come in from your online audience. I can run them off to you real quick if you can knock them down. Okay, go. Okay, first one, if a dead person can't be taxed, can't that be used against them? That yeah. They, that they say we are dead? And <clears throat> Remember me in, in tons and tons of phase one videos, I go, the IRS is so easy. That's how easy it is to get rid of them. The rest of that question, in what, in what other ways can our dead status be used? Well, I'd like to not be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Second question. Can I, I'll, I'll tell you something. It's not the dead that can't be taxed. It's the living that can't be taxed. You understand that, right? Ah, here's the issue, though. It doesn't even matter because you can't. What is this? A Federal Reserve note is a debt or a debenture. Are you getting paid in these? Yes. How do you tax a debt? Man, I'll tell you what, I write a short little one-page deal with about 20 questions on it and send it over to the IRS, and somebody owes, you know, they're claiming the owe $1.4 million, and I say, here, IRS, answer this question. And I send them over a little one-page with about 20 questions on it. And by the time you're done, you're getting a letter that says you don't owe nothing. It's that simple to get rid of the IRS. There's no law you got to pay taxes. You pay taxes by signing and filling out a 1040. And the day you filled out your first 1040 form, you became a taxpayer by voluntary compliance. You have to volunteer to pay a gift. Uh, 
Uh, that's a lie. Because it's an unconscionable contract. Where was the terms and conditions explained to you the year you first filed the 1040 that you volunteered for that? That's right, because it doesn't exist. It's an unconscionable contract. The IRS is so easy. It's pathetic. Dave, here's our, here's our second online question. It All is, right. can we change the names of our offsprings or do they need to, to wait until they're 18? Well, did you like the name in the first place? <laughs> here's the third question. Do you need to make notice that are specific to each case and what happens after the notice is delivered and accepted? Okay, I'm going to change the word case to individual. Because you're an individual until you proved you're alive. So that's the case. Your notices have to go to each agency you've ever contracted with in your life. You don't have to. Notice to agent is notice to principal. The White House Office Inc., Joseph R. Biden, is the agent of service. And every agency that's associated under that as a subcontractor, really, it's done. Put it on the record. Go publicly publish it and record it. Second of all, you're going to want to do the biggies anyway. You're going to want to do the post office. You're going to want to do the Internal Revenue Service. You're going to want to do the Department of Health and Human Services. You're going to probably want to do the E-Verify system under the Department of Homeland Security. Okay? You're going to want to do the Secretary of State's office. You're going to want to do this, the Attorney General's office of the United States. And the Social Security office is one you're going to start it all through. So get through that first. Notice everybody else. Well, Dave, thank you for that. And I'd just like to say one thing, one last thing, and that is uh, give a shout out to our online moderator, Miss Krista, whom we love so much. We wouldn't have been able to do this without her for sure. Krista, we love you. Thank you. What for? That's just a bank. I could care less. You're talking about the little stars? Don't worry about that. That's the Department of Homeland Security Risk Assessment. It doesn't really matter. That's the way they look at you, and they look at you wrong anyway. You're just a damn enemy to them until you're not. <laughs> freedom Bot has the steps to freedom. Basically, it's not much different than it used to be on the first 10. But remember, the first 10 was designed for levels one, two, and three. And then I used to say, I'm not going to teach about the trust until you're ready. We're out of time. You're getting it. And we're learning more and more and more, and we're going back and making sure that stuff I learned a long time ago is valid or not. And some of it's not, by the way. So we've weeded that out. Okay. <laughs> What's that? No. No, they don't, really. Do your AOR. Get stuff recorded on the land so they know. That's publicly publishing something. There's, there, there's something very important about publicly publishing stuff. Okay, there's ways to do that. There's hard ways and there's easy ways. The easy way is just to take it to a county and get it recorded. That's really the easiest way. And Pima County is great, but there's others. 
Pima County has built new buildings because of us. I mean, they, they, we have created an entire economy in Pima, Arizona because of the state national movement. I mean, everybody in California has to use Pima County because no county in California will record our documents. And you know what? California's flag says California Republic. Right on it. Sure. That's right. They're just expensive. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Every state's a little different. Some of them really give you heck. Some of them, not at all. Okay. You've mentioned several times about women who think that they to Well, it just adds to how many it can populate out. It's like lottery numbers. For a divorced person like me, who kept my married name, should I go back to my maiden name? Because that's what the numbers are. Or should I use what the name I'm using now when I change my name? Yeah, you're going to populate out both of them, but the name you choose for your legal name, that's your choice, not my choice. Okay? Well, here's what we did for Bonnie. Her official court-ordered exemplified name change is Bonnie Ruth Allen, which is on her birth certificate, Bonnie Ruth Allen straight. We added my name to it. That's her name change name. So she has four names now instead of three. That's up to you. That's your decision how you do it. But it's going to be a in my opinion, it needs to make sure it's referenced to your DNA and to your birth certificate and ask in there for the, uh, the confidential, certified confidential birth and death vital statistics record. It's a lot to spit out, isn't it, for one name of a document? Oh, you don't like him anyway, do you? One, I already got, already got my AOI, and I want to go to the SSA and do that. Do I, do I have to go to a court to get my name changed, even though I've already got all the documentation done? Absolutely. I got to legally get it changed in court so that I can get the death certificate. Okay. Uh, this is one thing I hope you learn from this weekend, is how many names do you have? No, you don't. You have hundreds that they can use against you. Exactly. You got to take those hundreds of names and make it one. Right. And the second portion of the question would be, when I go to get that double authentication, do I want the birth and the death on there, or do I want one of each? Well, one with just the birth, one with birth and death. One is prima facie evidence of the birth, and the other one is law. 